Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. I'm actually on time, I love it. <laughs> I was just a little bit racing around here trying to make sure everything was done before we started. Hi Michael, you were first, you did it. Hi Santana Reef. Listen, uh, we've uh, been bouncing around with different topics over the last few months and uh, I'm looking forward to this one today because we haven't talked about it in a while and that's about sand bed maintenance. And uh, I know that if you're a person that has a bare bottom tank, you're not gonna care about this topic at all. But, and this is my own personal opinion, I hate the look of a bare bottom tank. I just find it to be so unnatural. Um, I've, I'm a diver when I can get out there. Uh, I've snorkeled and I've never seen glass at the bottom <laughs> of any spot I've ever dove. And that whole flat, nat uh, it looks like a museum display to me. It just, you know, like when they put a bone on display behind a glass cover on a glass base. And I'm just like, <sighs> I get it. You know, you want it to look pristine and clean. An aquarium, though, is a living biotope. It's, I don't know. It, it's just, you know, I, I try to imagine anything else and just an aquarium needs a substrate. And, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, I can't think of a single, on the freshwater side, planted tank that has a glass bottom. They always have something on the bottom. So why are saltwater people trying to avoid sand? Uh, number one reason they feel that it's a nutrient sink, that it's all just going to trap the stuff. It's going to grow the cyanos. It's going to grow dinoflagellates. It's going to grow this. It's going to allow these things to exist. And getting rid of the sand bed is the simplest form. Uh, the other argument is that I want to have lots of flow in my tank. And if I have sand, it blows everywhere and I can't keep it looking nice. So I just want it gone. I, you know, that's, I, I understand the argument. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I have felt the same way for 20 plus years. Every time I see one, I'm like, that tank would look so much better with sand. So I, I'm going to throw out a perk about having sand for those of you that might have a bare bottom tank that just did it because you were told to do it. And that is that when you have sand in the tank, the lighting from above will bounce off the sand and reflect on the lower part of your corals to give them additional light. So that to me is a huge boon and I would highly recommend it because having even growth of a coral is better than just having the tops of the corals looking pretty because that's where they're getting the light and everything underneath being essentially shaded or shadowed. So having those re reflective properties off of a light sand bed is actually beneficial to your livestock and of course makes me happy because I want to see your tank, it looks better. <laughs> I'm not trying to get a bunch of hate mail, but if you need my email address, I will provide it. <laughs> the fact is, is that having a sand bed has been one of my choices in every tank I've set up. Um, the barring that the only tank I've ever run without sand would be my quarantine tank. And, you know, because a quarantine tank is right on the cusp of being a hospital tank and you don't want to have sand in there because the medications would be absorbed and trapped in it. It would be hard to remove it. And so typically in those scenarios, I like to have some live rock in there that's dedicated to the quarantine tank. I wouldn't even put rock in a hospital tank because of the medicine. But um, that was the only time. Every other tank I've ever had always had some sand, whether it was a, just a little shallow sand bed uh, in a small three-gallon aquarium because it would look ridiculous as much sand in three gallons. But uh, if you have a, a bigger tank, having a sand bed that's between two and four inches deep is generally... Um, the It looks good when you're viewing it as just the casual observer. And uh, like my big tanks, you know, my 280-gallon, my 400-gallon, these tanks always have a four inch to six inch sand bed. And uh, of course it doesn't look smooth like a concrete pad. It has uh, low spots and high spots. There are mounds here and there, there are eddies, you know, because of the flow of the tank is actually shifting it around. And so possibly your livestock is shifting it around too. I mean, perhaps you've seen this in your own aquarium. You may have a clownfish that seems to be very, um, uh, almost doing like the nesting thing and they will swim into the sand and then uh, kick their fins really hard and actually create a depression. And it's like, why are you doing that? You don't put eggs there. I don't know what you're doing, but they just seem to like doing that. So you might have a clownfish doing that. You may have a fish that sift the sand because you thought that was a good way to keep it clean. Uh, actually, the fish is just sifting the sand because it's looking for food. <laughs> it's it's not saying, oh, that's my job. I clean sand. I, that was what I was put on this earth in this ocean was to keep sand beds clean. No, they're just doing what they do to eat. And so we have those types of fish that do exist. There are starfish that uh, will work the sand bed. 
Um, some are good for fish only systems uh, and terrible for reef tanks. And I've mentioned that before and I'll talk about that as well. But uh, let's see what we got going on here in the chat because I don't want to ignore anyone. A lot of times I, I get into the topic, I look at the camera and I ignore everything on my screens. And so I need to do better, right? Uh, Robert says, I just finished last week's live stream two minutes ago. Well, then it's just like part two. It just keeps going. And uh, Reef Rondo is here from Scotland. I'm the Scottish guy Scott Oliphant mentioned at the end of his Markna presentation. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. I hope you enjoy the topic. Fish Freak Phil says, I love the look of substrate in the tanks so much in planted tanks. They even use different kinds for different aesthetics. And they'll do things like sand waterfalls and how come we don't do sand waterfalls in a reef tank and why can't we that's a good question um <laughs> michael says you have to go with sand so anyway I, i'm sure some other people jump in the chat momentarily and like sand evil sand bad destroy sand hulk smash sand i, I get it um <laughs> triggerfish says one of my buddies tried to get me to go with a bare bottom which is the term for no sand and i told him no way ever every time he comes by he's blown away how clean my sand is and asks how often i clean it and i say never see okay so that's the point of this topic because there are people out there with sand beds that look dirty and then you got someone like triggerfish who says my sand bed looks pristine or clean all the time and he's not doing anything specifically so why is it that you can keep a clean sand bed without doing anything is the question or the topic of the day because we want to have an easy to maintain reef aquarium and so there are some things that you put into play that will take care of it for itself so you don't have to do the work um you know hands-on diy so let's get into it with sand you know, the first thing I do is use a sand made for the reef aquarium. And so I don't recommend ever buying something like play sand from Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, you know, because you don't know what is in that sand. It's designed for a sand box. It's designed uh, possibly for construction and they aren't trying to make sure it's food grade. They're not trying to make sure there's no metals in there or any of the contaminants that could actually affect your livestock. And if you were to choose to use that sand or if you have used that sand, my best advice to you now is to start siphoning it out uh, a quarter of the tank at a time for the next four weeks until it's all removed completely and then gradually introduce new sand that is nice and clean and safe. When you buy sand at the fish store, you might find big bags, big bags of it, probably 40, 50 pound bags that are packaged very dry. You know, you can just tell it's dry sand and you can introduce that into your tank and I'll explain how. And then they'll have smaller bags, what's called live sand, and you can see there's water of some kind in there, and it's also sealed. And it, like, did I say about 20 pounds, 10, 20 pounds, 15 pounds, somewhere in there, you'll have that range. Now, the sand itself uh, that is wet is considered live sand, and there is a dormant bacteria in there waiting for you to tear open the bag and allow oxygen into it, and then that bacteria will come to life and become part of your sand bed in the aquarium. So it's a really good thing to add from time to time, especially if your sand bed is for some reason dead. Uh, and I don't mean dry, I mean like literally you've put in a sand sifting starfish and it ate all the life out of your sand bed. You have a dead sand bed in your aquarium that is growing algaes and you don't know why. It's because all the beneficial bacteria was consumed by that exact starfish that doesn't belong in a reef tank. That's why I said it's okay in a fish only. Now, if you uh, are starting a brand new tank and you're pouring in sand, you just pour in the sand. It's, you can do it. Some people say, do you put the sand first and then the rock, or do you put the rock first so it touches the glass and then add the sand? Well, actually, the best thing you could possibly do with a lot of prep work would be to create some kind of a support system for your rock work to sit on so it's not on the glass. It's literally on, like, PVC pieces. So for example, I never have anything handy. Uh, let's just, mm, let's pretend this is your PVC piece. <laughs> Here's a nice handy piece of acrylic. Um, if you had something about this tall on the bottom of your aquarium, it could be a PVC coupling. It could be two inch PVC pipe that you cut this tall and you put these rings all along the bottom of the aquarium on the glass. And then you set your aquascape and you put those rings under wherever it needs to be so the rock work stays in place. We want the rock work to be super stable. We don't want it to collapse and fall. And this actually takes the pressure off the glass because you're not putting points of rock directly on the bottom pane. 
Instead, the points of the rock are sitting inside the recess of the PVC collar, and it's spreading the pressure of the rock across a wider area instead of pinpoint spots on the rock itself. And then once you've got your rock work resting on these little PVC stands, then you can add the sand and hide it all. And you'll never see it until something happens. You know, some fish is digging close to it. And you're like, oh, I see an edge of the PVC. Let me fill that in. I mean, that could happen. But in and, and my tank, I actually have an acrylic support system. I think I should do a video about that one time. Uh, maybe in a, later this month. I've got a, a guest next week. So maybe the one after that will do the acrylic support system. And that one was such a, a terrible ordeal. It probably took me 10 hours, 12 hours with help. And I said, I hate this. I never want to do it again. And yet it is still supporting my rock 10 years later. And I never have a rock slide or rock shift. And I remember rock slides in my 280. They were miserable. The rock started to move. I was trying to uh, adjust things and I needed a third hand. I have two, two. I needed three because you got this one holding a rock. You got this one trying to put another rock in, but you got to have a third hand to hold it all back because it's trying to collapse. And it was so frustrating and I, I, you just kind of do what you can. And what the funny thing is when it comes to rock falling down when, because of the sand is shifting or whatever, is that you can never get it exactly back the way it was. It was perfect. It's like a one-time puzzle piece. And as soon as you remove that rock, uh, things shift slightly and you just cannot get that one back in the way it was. It, it's impossible. Prove me wrong. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Now, I used my acrylic support system throughout the entire tank for seven feet, and I actually had huge pieces of acrylic. I mean, I say huge, but it, it's all relative. But I'd say I probably had a <clears throat> 16 to 18 inch, no, it's probably 20 inches wide. I'd have to double check my, my blog. 20 inches wide by 30 inches deep with all these little acrylic legs. And I put three different ones in my tank, and then I set all my rock work on that. And it lifted everything up uh, four inches off the same, off the glass bottom. And then I placed all the rocks specifically to their spot. Each rock was assigned a certain acrylic rod. It sounds insane. That's why I said it might be a good topic for a live stream. And that's why it took so darn long to do. It was so exhausting that, you know, it, the hours just went on and on and on. And I was like, oh, I should never have done this. <laughs> but I I, <clears throat> I did like it. I liked it a lot, and I still, to this day, am appreciative that I was able to set that up. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll throw this in there really quick because it's part of this. Uh, Mitch says, uh, some bare-bottom tanks will use starboard on the bottom to protect the glass. Starboard is the same stuff as cutting board material. It's HDPE, and it is. Um, it was something that, man, I remember probably 15, 20 years ago, people were like, I need to buy starboard, and they would try to put it down to the bottom of the tank, but it's buoyant. It floats. And so they would have to weight it down with like, I don't know, I think they used like, they'd fill pantyhose stockings with sand and then set those on the starboard to press it down so they could do their aquascape and dissipate the, the pressure points of the rock on the glass. Uh, and once the rock was there, the starboard didn't float up anymore. But uh, that was one technique that people used. Thanks for bringing that up, Mitch. I appreciate it. Now, when the... Uh, <clears throat> The rock are all properly supported on their pillars, as I so describe them. Then you can fill in all that sand, and you could do this before the water's in the tank. Um, it might be easier to pour it in at that point. And you should be adding the sand from a plastic bag. And if you, I don't know, I'm just saying because, you know, we do a lot of weird things in this hobby, and you buy things used, and you fill up buckets. If you have a bucket filled with sand, for example, and you want to pour it in the tank, don't do what I did on the very first day of my 400 gallon because I scratched my glass and I was so mad at myself. Uh, I had this bucket full of sand. I lowered it into the tank and I'm using my arm between <clears throat> the bucket itself. I, somehow I was using my arm. I thought there's absolutely no way this bucket is touching the glass. I will not scratch it. And my buddy Wes was like, what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. And I'm like, what, what? I'm being careful. And he's like, the metal handle is rubbing the glass. And did it rub the glass? It literally like carved this weird like etching in the front, in the middle of the front panel because I'm holding the bucket and I thought I'm keeping plastic off, but the metal handle stick out farther on the bucket and that handle was just grinding the glass. <clears throat> and I was completely unaware of it. <clears throat> 
and it was super aggravating to look at my brand new tank just got its water and there's a huge gouge in the front at the eye line where you'll see it every day for the rest of your life from day one and uh i'm fortunate <laughs> that 13 months later that tank leaked and they had to replace it so i got to get rid of my stupidity so when you're adding sand to your tank i recommend that you have a bucket that has no handles on it uh, or transfer the sand maybe into like trash bags that you could then lower into the tank and you could either pour out or tear the bag open and release it but just just be cognizant that you don't use anything that can possibly damage your brand new aquarium because it's super frustrating if you're trying to add sand to an existing tank i know people have said this many many times that they would go ahead and use a pvc pipe <clears throat> to pour the sand down i've never bothered that just seemed like a monster hassle to me i'd much rather just stop all the flow in the tank um, possibly do this during a water change when the water's a little lower but not absolutely necessary and then lower the bag into the water uh, so that the opening is near the bottom of my bag so i can just basically lift the bag upward and the sand's pouring out into a mound in the aquarium and then i just spread it out and then i restart the flow it's a real simple process so now that sand is in the tank, how do we maintain it? How do we make sure that it looks nice? Well, there are certain things that are going to happen depending on the age of the aquarium. If the tank's been established for a long time and you're just now adding sand, probably nothing is going to happen and you'll just uh, have a nice sand bed. There's a possibility you may get some diatoms on it. If it's a brand new tank, you're absolutely going to get diatoms on it. And diatoms are a type of food source for bacteria. So... If you start to see a little bit of brown dusting on your sand, that's okay. If you see a thick brown dusting, that's not so okay. And it could even be something that's growing that you don't want in your tank, which uh, I recently encountered in Caitlin's Reef, which is something called Osteopsis, and it's a type of dinoflagellate. So the problem is with the brown dusting, there are you know basically three types of things it can be. Diatoms, some type of dinos, possibly hints of cyano, and a lot of times just a picture of it is not a good way to identify it. You have to look at it. You have to, you know, uh, get a good glance and it has to be under white light. If you're trying to look at your sand bed under blue light, you're, you're not going to get any help and you're not going to give yourself any uh, help either because you just can't identify things properly under weird lighting. But uh, let's just assume your tank is young. You know, it's the, you set up the brand new tank. You've got your rock supported. You've got your sand in there. You've got your salt water added and, you know, a month later, you're starting to see this stuff on the sand because your lights are on and you're like, oh man, you know, it looked so good on day one. It looked so good for the first couple of weeks. But once I started my lights, they, it, the sand just started to get ugly. That's kind of that ugly phase that new tanks have. So that is something normal, natural, and uh, it's kind of needed to establish the sand bed. Now, adding bacteria to the tank, like using bags of live sand, like I mentioned earlier, or actually buying beneficial bacteria and adding to the tank in an area where there's no flow temporarily just to let it get into there is a method that helps approach uh, getting uh, bacteria into the sand bed. Uh, it could be things like Microbacter 7 is one type of bacteria, which you can place in the aquarium. Uh, I would just turn off the protein skimmer for about 10, 20 minutes just to kind of let it get into the system and not suck it right back out again. If you are adding something like Microbacter 7 and you have a sump beneath with filter socks, that's okay. Uh, the bacteria is fall so fine, it'll just go right through the mesh of the filter sock and continue in and circulate until it finds places to adhere. It'll adhere to the walls of the tank, it'll adhere to the rock, it'll adhere to the sand, <clears throat> it'll adhere to the inside of the plumbing, um, it'll be on the inside of your sump. I mean, bacteria is everywhere. And uh, if you don't believe me, <laughs> just think about any kind of food you leave it on the counter too long bacteria is everywhere so we want to make sure that we are adding some because we want the sand bed to have it now recently someone uh, <clears throat> probably watches this channel i think reached out and said mark i'm up in oklahoma and uh, i'm starting this tank and i really want something to seed my sand bed and he said can i where can i buy some i said well back in the day one of the techniques that we were doing to uh get better biodiversity of uh the creatures in our sand beds we actually were shipping sand to each other from hobbyist to hobbyist across the nation. And, you know, you would tell a guy in California, I want a cup of your deep sand bed. And you tell someone in Florida, I want a cup of your deep sand bed. And they'd put it in a Ziploc bag and they'd mail it to you. And you'd just take that bag and you'd lower it in the tank. You'd stop all the flow again. I always stop the flow when I'm adding something new. Just stop the flow so you can see what you're doing and you're not 
spreading it everywhere, right? And then you lower the bag or the little cup or whatever it is you've got. You know, I mean, you, let's, let's say you have a small plastic cup or one of those specimen cups like for urine samples and you could take the sand and you could lower in the tank and you could just pour it gently into a mound on your existing sand and then, uh, then turn the flow back on. That little hill will level itself out. You don't need to sprinkle it. You don't have to stir the sand to make it go in. It will completely do that on its own. And the beneficial bacteria tends to live in the upper half inch of the sand bed. So all the stuff below, you're not trying to get uh, bacteria down deep. That's That happens naturally. You don't have to do it, which is nice. If you're adding sand to an existing sand bed because you want it to be deeper, uh, I want to mention this specifically, you only want to add a half an inch at a time so that the, the bacteria in that current half inch can migrate up. If you have an existing sand bed, the top half inch is live, and then you add two inches of sand, you'll smother it and kill it all. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So you're going to, if you're saying, I really want to add two more inches to my tank, I think it'll look better. And then you're going to want to add some this week and then next week and then the next week, and you'll bring it up a little bit at a time. That way everything keeps migrating up and you don't lose the benefits of the live uh, bacteria, the benthic uh, fauna that's in your sand bed, and uh, and you at the same time get to increase the deep sand bed. And why a deep sand bed? Why do I keep saying deep? Why do I keep saying three, four inches of sand? It sounds so crazy. Well, the the rule of thumb back in the day was to the deeper the sand bed, the better the nitrate reduction in the aquarium. So if you were to uh, have a four inch to six inch to eight inch sand bed, you'd have you know really good opportunities to denitrify the aquarium because the area down low in the sand bed is oxygen deprived. It's called anaerobic and that area there is where a specific type of bacteria exists that does not live off oxygen, but it needs to feed off something to live and it feeds off nitrate. So it's actually a really cool way to keep nitrate under control in your aquarium, especially in a tank with a heavy bioload uh, lots of corals, lots of fish, lots of feeding. And so in those scenarios, you that was kind of the general rule. Live rock, deep sand bed. You put those two together, boom. That plus a protein skimmer, and you're going to have a, a beautiful reef. And lots of people did. These days, <clears throat> a lot of aquariums seem to have a uh, very, very minimalistic look to the rock work. We've, the pendulum has swung so far from what it was to where it is today that... <clears throat> those tanks actually need some additional type of filtration in the system to make uh, the look you want work. So I'm going to throw this up on the screen here. Give me a second. I got to find it. I am not prepared. Let's see. Do I have it? No, I don't. Let me go find it. At least I know where it is, which helps. All right, there you go. This is the cover of Coral Magazine. This issue is going to press basically Tuesday. <laughs> so uh, if you are not a subscriber to this magazine, you need to get it. You need to get the subscription now, like today. Worst, you know, I mean, at, at, the, at the latest tomorrow, because if you get it later, like if you wait, you know, a week, if you wait till Monday or Tuesday, uh, it will be too late and you won't get this issue. You'll end up having to uh, wait two months for the next issue. Uh, this issue on filtration is super. It's great. Uh, I have packed this magazine with everything I could find on filtration. And it's a team effort. I say I because I'm the executive editor of Coral Magazine. And so I want you, of course, to appreciate <laughs> the hard work that's gone into it. Uh, and I uh, literally said, I want this article in there. I want this. I want this huge interview. Um, which we did. We're going to actually have supplemental interview videos that will show up on the Coral Magazine channel. So if you are not on the Coral YouTube channel right now as a subscriber, please do join that. And it, I'm not trying to run a whole new channel. That's not my job. My job is Me Loves Reef. But I um, am going to tell you that we have four or five video interviews with different manufacturers that are going to show up on that after this magazine is available and everyone can read it. So that will be supplemental and I hope that you enjoy it. So back to my comment about 
the uh, minimalistic rock in the system, and I know I'm migrating away from sand, but there's a reason I'm bringing this up. If you, back in the day, and I'm going to say probably 20 years ago, 2004, 2005, 2006, people would set up reef tanks and they would pack it completely with live rock. They would just fill it up with so much rock. And there was hobbyists out there that did not like the cost. They said, it's too expensive and uh, I don't want to pay $8 a pound. I, I want a better option. And so, you know, of course, through uh, word of mouth and, you know, forums, communication between different hobbyists, they would say, well, if you start with base rock, you can get that cheap from a lump, from a local uh, rock quarry, and then you can buy some live rock. And so, you know, it was a point where people were like, I'm going to buy 50% base rock, I'm going to put in 50% live rock. I'm going to save half the money. And I was like, okay, I could see where you're coming from. And then it would, of course, go further away from that. And then it's like, well, I filled my tank with base rock and I just want to put in one piece of live rock. Is that going to be enough? And I would tell them what I still say to this day. It will work. It's going to take forever for that bacteria and the beneficial stuff off the live rock to migrate to all the rest of your rock. And then eventually, no more live rock. People stopped buying it entirely for whatever reason. Probably money, but uh, you know, also it wasn't as uh, uh, predominant in the industry. And uh, we had things like Marco Rock that had basically cornered the market on buying dry rock that cost much less, that shipped easily, that didn't have any kind of pests. And people embraced it. You know, not at first. There was some resistance. But then just like in metal halides versus LEDs, eventually everyone has LEDs. And hardly anyone has metal halides anymore, right? Well, um, now we have gone from a tank full of dry rock to a tank full of minimalistic rock. Like it's twigs that you plant your corals on. And there's no rock work. There's nowhere for fish to hide and call home. Everything's swimming in the open. There's no hidey holes. There's no... Uh, places to call bedtime <clears throat> and I find that that extreme uh, layout might be cool looking to the hobbyist but it's not great for the animals themselves and additionally the uh, the lack of rock the lack of all the benefits of living biomass that will help to consume waste in the water column it's gone and so then you're going to need some kind of filter. Uh, and that's why I pointed to this magazine right here, because I want you to see oh, right here that you there's a whole subject about why this is so important that you find an alternate that you stick in the sump beneath to handle that load because you have so little rock in the aquarium. All right, that was it. Now let me get back to sand beds. <laughs> Let's see. Now the... Uh, the sand itself, like, you know, we talked about it being a new tank versus an older tank, but now how do we just keep it clean? The first thing you're going to need is some kind of creature in your aquarium that does it for you so you don't have to do the hard work. And invariably, the best choice usually is going to be Nasarius snails. Nasarius snails are little tiny snails that, well, there's different sizes. There are actually some that are kind of big called Tongan super, uh, super Tongan Nasarius snails, and they're, they're big like the size of a grape. But there's other ones that are smaller that are more like the size of a pea. And those snails will live in the sand bed and they will emerge when there's food in the water. They, If you look very, very closely at the sand bed in a tank that has these, you'll see a little tiny thing sticking up that's kind of opaque. Kind of looks like the trunk of an elephant just kind of sticking up out of the sand. And it's basically sniffing the water. <laughs> that's what I think it's doing. And then when you add food, they all just bubble up you know, like, they come out and they start moving and they can move quickly across the sand they get super excited they love they love to eat but the nice thing is as they're moving through the sand whether they're submarines under the sand or running across the surface of it they are churning the sand they're helping to keep it clean and they're also looking for any kind of food that they can consume and they're only eating waste they're not eating beneficial bacteria so you're not losing the creatures that you need in the sand bed to give you a healthy, clean one like uh, Triggerfish had mentioned earlier. Another thing that you can put in a sand bed to keep it clean would be a fighting conch or a sand conch. Now, fighting conchs are bigger and uh, the sand conchs are smaller. And conch is C-O-N-C-H. So you might think it's K-O-N-K. -K. It's not. 
and the uh, sand conch is a really good benefit to your aquarium and you want one per two square feet of sand. Now, my tank is seven feet long and it's three feet wide and there's rock all over the place. So I still would look at my tank and say, how many two by two uh, patches of sand do I have, even if there's rock? That's okay. Um, you don't want to have too many because then there's a lack of food and you might lose some. And too few, well, you're not getting the benefit of your aquarium. So basically, uh, if your tank is six feet by two feet, you need three sand conks. It's real easy. How many series do you need for that size tank? Oh, I'd probably say 15 or 20. I mean, I'm not telling you to put in hundreds, you know, just, just some. And then, of course, introducing sand, like I was talking about, where we shipped it to each other, that was a good way to get some beneficial bacteria. Now, you could go to your fish store, and if they have a really pretty display tank, you could say, can I buy a cup of sand from that tank right there? And they're like, well, we don't like to reach in that tank. It's like, yeah, I get it, but that's the healthy tank. That's where I wander from. If they have a different tank that looks good and you're, you like it, and you're like, okay, I'll do that. I mean, any live sand is going to benefit your tank. And so if you have a type of bacteria in your tank now, introducing a different bacteria from a different system could help uh, diversify, do a biodiversity, basically. And that is what we're looking for, is to have a few different types of healthy bacteria down in the tank and not just become one monoculture of just one kind that dominates the tank. Uh, a couple of years ago... I was running into a problem with my aquarium, as you guys know, and I truly believe that I had one type of bacteria just destroy my beneficial bacteria, and it was dominating the tank, and it was causing problems. And so I had to introduce some other bacteria to kind of get things leveled out again. And it's not that hard to do. I mean, because like I said, we got products on the market. I mentioned Microbacter 7. Uh, there's Dr. Tim's. There's the stuff from Reef Bright that's called uh, Live Rock Enhance. Um, there is... Uh, BioDigest from Prodibio, uh, lots of different things out there you can put in your tank to help increase your uh, bacteria within the aquarium and uh, and into the sand bed itself. And then hermit crabs. Oh man, so many people hate hermit crabs. They blame them for everything. They're evil, they're evil. No, but they're very active and you will catch them doing things you don't like. And so I can understand why people try to rule them out, but they scurry across the sand and they're churning it up with their little bodies. They're dragging shells behind them. Their little legs are digging. They're not digging down. They're just trying to move forward. So having those in the tank are going to be really good. And then, you know, I told you guys, no sand sifting starfish. Bad, evil starfish for a reef tank. Destroys all the life in your sand bed. Look it up. Google it. It's fine. I will wait here. I'll just wait. I'm going to let you Google it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but no, you should Google it if you don't believe me. Uh, instead, serpent starfish would be great in that tank because they work across the surface. They look for decay. Uh, they are going to, of course, hope for food. And they are going to help stir the sand with their legs. Now, Obviously, they're not raking the entire sand bed like you would hope, but they're moving about. They're always traveling. They don't just stay in one spot like a cucumber, um, and that leads to cucumbers. There are different cucumbers on the market. Some are stationary, like there's these little yellow ones. They kind of look like a, a fat little nudibranch, and they will find a spot on the rock, and they will glue their body there for the rest of their life, for eternity. They never move. They just stick out these things, and they filter feed food from the water column. Cool to look at, not a bit helpful, <laughs> not even slightly helpful. You want some kind of cucumber that works the sand bed. My absolute hands down favorite cucumber I've ever bought, and I only had to buy one, was the tiger tail cucumber. That thing will go everywhere in your aquarium. It stretches super long, and it has like, I think five. I, 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 I don't know. I don't remember counting them. Maybe it, it's probably six. Things seem to be in round numbers when it comes to these types of creatures. But let's just say it's five. They have like five mop heads that will come out. So the first one goes down on the sand and grabs just like with his, like a sucker, grabs some stuff and then pulls that thing into its mouth in the center. And then as it licks it clean, the next one goes down on the sand and then it goes in there and then it goes out and the next one goes down. And it's constantly doing this in rotation around all the different appendages that are either five or six. And it's mopping your sand bed clean and they stretch super long. They like to keep one part of their body attached to the rock work or maybe to some glass nearby. You know, they want to, they don't want to roll around. You know, they, they want to have purchase, but they will stretch super long. And the benefit is when they get to a certain size, 
they'll basically tear themselves in half and now you have two and <laughs> i bought one tiger tail probably in 2003 and 21 years later my reef right now probably has six or seven and i've given some away to other hobbyists that were here at the time it was just opportunity you know opportunity arose oh you want a cucumber here you go and i handed it to them and they took it home so i like them i've had them go up the glass i've had them circle uh, like literally encircle a vortex pump and like oh, you don't belong there but they're you know <clears throat> doing their thing and then they work their way back down again into this you know near the sand so i do recommend that one a lot my tank is so big that when occasionally a tiger tail cucumber does get itself hurt by a power head like a vortex it doesn't hurt my tank but i know people with smaller tanks say oh a cucumber went through the pump and destroyed my my system that's usually going to be a, a density problem you have so much um of their entrails in a very small ecosystem with very little water that it's more polluted than a huge tank like mine being 450 gallons of water it can handle a cucumber getting partially or completely shredded by a pump and over the years i've had the occasional one die and that's why i don't have 50 of them in my tank and i have like six or seven <laughs> and there have been times when i was switching tanks as you know because things happen and as I'm taking apart plumbing, I'll find one in the PVC pipe in absolute darkness that has just lived there. It wasn't just on its migrating way from here to there. I, apparently it was in there because it was pretty small, but it was alive. And it was just doing its thing. And, you know, so of course I put it in the refugium to let it start to grow and get bigger again. But uh, I really like them. There are pink cucumbers you can put out there that just, they look like a pink turd on the sand bed. I've seen black ones as well and i don't know how much they move i i just find them visually unappealing so i don't buy that type so i don't have any personal experience with them but i have experienced going to people's homes and seeing their tanks and there's a big pink cucumber there's a big black cucumber you know it's kind of like all right you know i don't like it and usually they look dirty um, and in the ocean i've seen especially in uh, ocean videos i've seen some enormous cucumbers that people have picked up to hold i guess for a sense of scale for their video or their pictures and uh there is a weird thing that can happen with cucumbers. It's never, ever happened to me. But I came across this story about two years ago where someone lifted a cucumber out of the water, and I believe this was somewhere off of an island somewhere. It wasn't like an aquarium situation. And they were just holding it, and I think it just ruptured or exploded in their hand. I was like, what? Why would that happen? That's so weird. And that's when I went down this crazy rabbit hole, and apparently, you know, lifting them out of the water could end up resulting in the death of the cucumber strange thing but i've never experienced that at all with the tiger tails whatsoever because that's the one species i've always had it always works they're great they propagate themselves and so i recommend them for uh, sand bed maintenance because they're so practical they're so useful and they're so active uh, you'll usually see them at night you can see them during the daytime um, when I go looking for them, they're not always easy to find, but if I study this, the structure of my reef hard enough, I do find them. And, uh, you know, it's nice to just kind of do a head count from time to time. Speaking of head count, just a quick digression from this topic. I wanted to mention yesterday was nine years ago, yesterday, not nine years ago, today, that I put the skunk clownfish in my 400 gallon. And I put in 11 clownfish nine years ago yesterday. And, um... Then last week, I was kind of doing a head count during the feeding time because that's when they all come basically out into the open and they're not snuggled in the tentacles of the anemones. And uh, I kept counting and counting and counting and I kept getting to 10, but I couldn't see the whole reef. And I think I still have all 11. I mean, I'm relatively certain I have lost none of those skunk clownfish, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's a nice long duration of me keeping these fish. And I just wanted to mention that in today's live stream. Okay. What else can you put in a sand bed that can uh, keep it clean? And oh, by the way, I want to talk about the hermit crabs again because the hermits themselves, there are different types. There's the, uh, the blue leg, which is super popular. There's the red leg. There's the scarlet. There's the Halloween hermit. Uh, those are the four predominant ones available in the hobby. And blue legs are usually what people buy. Now, I personally would only buy blue legs for the look because they're pretty. I mean, they're, the, the blue on their legs just glows. It's gorgeous. And it's best under white light. <laughs> you can really appreciate it. I mean, think about it. You got a tank that's blue with blue legs. How much blue can you possibly see? 
but uh, yeah, I'm sure they, I'm sure they can look good. But if your tank lighting leans more toward daylight, then the blue legs are stunning to look at. They're really pretty. And obviously the bigger they get, uh, the more beautiful they can be. But also the blue legged hermit, I believe tends to be a little bit more aggressive and is more inclined to possibly eat some of your snails. Um, and so uh, I kind of give them a bad rap. I find that the red legged hermits and it's a really, it's almost a brown leg. Uh, you know, they're not red like glowing red. They are kind of a reddish, maroon, brownish type of leg. I find them to be far less aggressive in killing other things in the tank. And so they're beneficial as algae grazers and sand stirrers with their bodies as they run around in the tank and do their daily thing that they love to do so much. And then the scarlet hermit crabs are more expensive. They usually, you know, can garner, I don't know, eight, 12, $16 a piece. They're expensive. And having one or two in my tank is just because I like the look. Just pretty and I want them, uh, but they're not, um, they're not there to, to do a lot of work. But of course, they are gonna also scurry their bodies through the sand bed, which is beneficial. So if you're trying to put in some things that clean the tank, red legs are my choice. Scarlet just for looks. Blue legs if you're crazy. <laughs> It's okay to have blue legs. Uh, if you can get tiny ones, they don't have the ability to be aggressive and destructive. When I used to order my cleanup crew from Keys Critters out of Florida, man, I loved that company. And I became super sad the day they vanished. And they've been gone a long time. And they went away without a word. I mean, there was no announcement. They just one day, you couldn't get a hold of them. They were gone. I have no idea what happened to this company, the people involved. I love them. We Our club, DFW Mass., had purchased, over the years, we purchased probably 50,000 cleanup crew for our club. I mean, I, I know that because so many of those orders involve me doing group buys and I would be bringing in four to 5,000 critters in a shipment. And then it was too much work for that company. They, they like to ship a small box of like 12 hermits, 15 snails, a peppermint shrimp, a cucumber, you know, an urchin. And I'm like, we're going to need 800 Astrias and we're going to need uh, 1,200 Sereths and we're going to need uh, 900 Hermit Crabs and we're going to need, you know, it was crazy numbers. And so when this, these boxes, I'd usually get two boxes, which doesn't sound like much. And they'd get delivered here straight to FedEx. I'd drive up there at nine in the morning, get my boxes, come home, and I'd put them all over the kitchen table and I'd open up the bag of 100 or 200 Astrias and I would then take 12 out and put them in a Ziploc and write a name on there. And I get another 15 and put that in a Ziploc bag and put that over here. And I was actually divvying it all up. And then each person would show up throughout the day and get their bag of cleanup crew. And in this way of doing this method, this group I allowed people to get whatever they needed and shipping might have cost each person like five or six dollars. It was nothing. And so we loved doing that and we'd order these huge amounts. Um, and sometimes Keys Critters would send us the tiniest itty bitty blue legs. I'm like, oh, I love these guys because they would snack on the algae. That was where the glass and the sand bed touched that little area right there. They'd pick at it and pick it clean. Uh, the baby serifs would do the same thing. They'd snack on that area. So you didn't have to worry about taking a razor blade and cleaning the glass right where the sand bed was. And then of course the larger ones were all over the rock work and you know, they'd be doing their thing. So uh, the tiny ones, not so risky. But if you're trying to avoid issues, uh, feel free to try the red legs out and see how they operate in your tank and see if you agree with me uh, on their temperament because I think they're the better choice. But if you can't get them, get some blue legs. And if you can pick out the ones at the store, if you're there and you're like, I want that one and that one and that one, you can literally look for the smallest ones, of course. And if you want to get a couple of big ones and just see if they do anything destructive, you can. And you can also let me know what happened there and if I'm totally wrong or if I'm partially right. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm right. Um, now, is it okay to clean the sand bed? You know, can you siphon it? Yes. Can you run uh, some kind of scraper along the front? Because there was this big fear or tendency that you are not allowed to touch the sand bed at all costs, that anything you do to touch it, you will cause massive issues and it will lead to sulfuric eruptions that are going to kill your reef. And so there was actual literal fears. I mean, people were just like, I want to... I want the sand bed, but I'm scared of it. <laughs> How many times have you heard, I want such and such, but I've heard so many horror stories, I'm not willing to try it. I've heard them too. 
Um, but the sand bed itself is not something dangerous. And in all the tanks I've put up and taken down, tanks that have been running for many, many years, when I would t break down the tank, you know, like the 280, ran for six years, it started leaking, I had to break it down in 24 hours, and we got all the livestock out, as you guys saw in that big uh, nine-part series we did last year. And then I got down to the sand itself, and I'm scooping it out. And, of course, it's just full of uh, detritus. It's just brown, muddy sand. I mean, it's it's the worst of the worst because we took everything else out. And, of course, as we're removing rock and animals and whatever, it was all shedding crap into the water, which, of course, would then settle down and make the sand bed look even more dirty because of this massive moving thing which is not unlike moving everything out of one apartment or house into the next. And as you're grabbing all your things and leaving, then when you look at the rooms and you can see the carpets are just filthy, covered in all kinds of crap that came off everything during the moving process. Same principle with removing everything from the tank. The sand bed will look far worse than it actually was before you started the breakdown. But as I was scooping out the sand, I never came across black uh, sulfur smelling sand. And that is something that some hobbyists would encounter uh, in the early 2000s. They would have something going on with their tank. We did not have ICP testing. We didn't have uh, microbiomes. We didn't have any of that stuff. We just had our seller for test kits and we had flow and we had live rock. And uh, occasionally some guy would say, I pulled out this one rock and he'd take a picture and it's like black and it's just horrible. And you're like, oh my God. And thinking on that right now, I'm going to say huh, that possibly... What happened to that person's tank was that they had a dead sand bed that led to the sulfuric pocket. And I'm thinking the dead sand bed came from the sand sifting starfish that ate out all the good bacteria, leading to just decay and rot in the sand bed that is completely anoxic. And so, you know, life finds a way and even sulfur finds a way. And, things, and maybe that tank had a dead sand bed and so it led to that because no tank I've ever taken down out of being in this hobby since 1997, coming up on almost 30 years, right? In that time, I've never come across a bad pocket of sand in any of my tanks because I believe in live sand. And I you know, make sure that I have good circulation in the tank. I don't have stagnant water. I don't have oily slicks where the water's not moving. I, I'm big on flow in the aquarium. And I'm big on cleanup crews that are active in the aquarium and taking care of my sand bed. So... I've never come across it. I've looked for it repeatedly. I mean, I went there looking and expecting to find some sulfur under a rock, for example. And you would take the rock out, and the bottom of the rock wasn't covered in black. It didn't smell disgusting. It smelled clean like the ocean. And the sand came out. It was just dirty. Like I said, lots of brown mulm. And I would just take that sand, and I'd go wash it outside with a garden hose, and I'd just keep stirring and stirring and let the, the mulm float out and until all I had was a barrel of sand in water that I could stir as hard as I want, and it was clear water. I was like, okay, this sand is good. I'd dump out the water. I'd save the sand. It went to the next tank. And I had been repurposing sand for 20-plus years. Um, but, okay, so... That's just me throwing out a theory. I could be wrong about the sulfur thing, but it did happen to the occasional guy and it sucked. And, you know, because you would then, if you find a black pocket in the sand bed, you need to carefully scoop that out and throw it away. I wouldn't even try to save it or sand or uh, wash it. I don't think you can. I think the sulfur will have destroyed that sand, those grains, and uh, it's not something salvageable. So you would just scoop that and throw it away. But if all the rest of the sand is, is clean of that exact thing we're describing, you can use the rest. You don't have to say, oh, I found a sulfur pocket, which means all the sand is evil. That's not the case. It's only evil in that one spot and that part there you want to remove. Now, um, can you touch the sand bed? Yes. <clears throat> if you want to gravel vac it, you can. And all a gravel vac is is a long clear tube with a hose coming off of it and people will use them during a water change. They will press down into the, well, they, they start the siphon into a bucket or it goes through the python to the sink, or it goes through a long hose out a window or across the front door and down the dri driveway or whatever it is that you're doing. The, the tube then can be pressed down into the sand and then lifted. And as you press and lift and press and lift into the sand, you will see this brown muck going up the tube, but you also see the sand chasing the muck. And so you will pinch the tube at the top or fold it or squeeze it, you know, however you do to stop suction and what happens is the sand will then drizzle back down, but the mulm stays in the clear part of the tube, 
And then as soon as you release and allow water to continue siphoning, the brown stuff goes down. And so you would work your way by pressing, lifting, pressing, lifting, pressing, lifting repeatedly throughout the tank. And this is a method that a lot of fish stores do because they want their tanks to look clean all the time. And they may clean their sand bed three times a week <laughs> or more. I mean, they are constantly cleaning it and they're turning it over. They are literally putting sand in there for aesthetics rather than having a bunch of bare bottom aquariums for sale, uh, for uh, selling purposes. And they're gonna keep that sand as clean as they can because they don't want to have cyano, they don't want to have uh, diatoms, they don't want anything. They want clean white sand. They want you to think, oh my God, it's beautiful. And I need this and this and this and this. And that's completely normal and okay to do. But if you are siphoning your sand bed like that so abundantly, you're going to have to keep up that pace. Uh, to maintain that look, you have to do it on the regular. If you are wanting to run a deep sand bed and not touch it, like me or like Triggerfish mentioned earlier, you don't siphon it all the time. And uh, so there is um, some waste building up in that sand bed over time. So what you've seen when I did my reef reset, each time I've done it over the last few years, when, when I'd fly Dwayne in and make him help me, I would work one section of the tank at a time and I would siphon deep, deep clean a section of the sand bed <clears throat> and then refill the tank with salt water, with new water. And then the next day, because Dwayne's only here a few days, um, and then the next day I would do another section and then refill the tank with more salt water. And then the next day, and so in that process, I'm working my way around the aquarium, but I would have to move things off my sand bed because invariably I am the worst about putting things on the sand and letting them grow. <laughs> and they just cover it all up and I can't get to it. But uh, I see a lot of people that are so much better at this than I am where they arrange all their corals on the rock where they have all this sand just everywhere and they're able to maintain it uh, more readily because they can reach it more easily. There's not stuff in the way. Or for me, I've got to pick it up, move it over here, go clean this section, put all those things back over here. Now it's work on this section and move those things over to there and over to there. <laughs> and it's the whole thing. So cleaning it once or twice a year will not hurt the sand bed. It will not hurt the denitrification. It will not cause chaos. It is something you can do if you are so willing. Uh, in my case, I tend to really focus on the sand bed about every two years. But the rest of the time, I leave it alone. I just don't touch it. I, I let the cleanup crew do their thing. And then certain fish will help keep the sand clean. I mentioned the sand sifting gobies, but you've also got like the cold tang, which is a wonderful workhorse fish that is constantly like biting at the sand. And in Caitlin's Reef, interestingly enough, I see this regularly and I don't know that this is species specific, but I keep seeing the Japanese pygmy angelfish eating stuff off the sand. I don't know what it's eating, but it's constantly nipping at the sand bed um, on a regular basis. Now, as you guys know, it's not working because I do have this weird diatom thing. I'm sorry, uh, dinoflagellate thing going on, but I'm trying to solve it now. And this week I did pick up, oh, I want to talk about this. Uh, I did pick up the new UV for that tank. I haven't hooked it up. I have had zero time to work on it. And even now I'm doing my live stream. And as soon as I'm done with the live stream, I've got to jump back online with my coral team to finish up the last of our edits because they are working right now and I'm not available because I'm doing this with you guys. But as soon as I'm done, I got to get online with them and find out where we're at and see what I got to do today and tomorrow and Monday because Tuesday it goes to the printer. But um, the, the UV should be the final step of solving what's going on in that tank for me based on what I learned about this specific uh, type of dinoflagellate. But the point I'm saying is that that sand bed is not pristine and clean like I like it to be. It became a problem about two months ago. And I really thought, man, this is a really strange super bloom of diatoms I've never seen before. <laughs> but it was never long and stringy, didn't have bubbles in it. It was just this weird dusting. And, uh, I, and I don't have a huge cleanup crew in that tank because I didn't want them to eat my macro algaes. Now that tank is coming up on two years old and I think I'm about ready or fed up <laughs> of the whole desire to keep macro algae in there and I might just forego it and just let myself have a nice cleanup crew that keeps the tank nice and clean so I don't have to think about it, so I can just enjoy the tank and it'll become less, I mean, it doesn't require a lot of work, but it needs more internal critters to do what it needs to do so that I only have to focus on the occasional water change. And when I say occasional, originally I was trying to do them once a week and that's not happening, now it's once a month, which is kind of my standard in the past. When I did tanks, I recommend, you know, uh, how did that phrase come out of my mouth? 
because I still do tanks. <laughs> but when I was doing uh, my my smaller aquariums, my twenty nine gallon uh, you know, and uh, the three gallon and um, some of those small ones, I focused on them once a month. I did a twenty percent, twenty five percent water change once a month. And on Caitlin's Reef, I seem to be doing about a thirty percent water change once a month. So maybe almost forty percent. Uh, anyway, I'd like that tank to stay a little cleaner looking. It is sumpless. It really doesn't have any kind of filtration other than the sponge filters in the Shark Pro. And so adding this UV on the back will be good. Um, I will report back to you how it all works. You know, how and I'm not just talking about solving the problem, but how it's going to affect the water temperature because several have said that my tank temperature may go up and I'd like the water to stay cooler in that tank for the uh, angelfish because it's a colder water fish. So uh, I'm obviously going to be keenly aware of how it affects it. And uh, my thought process for this specific dinoflagellate is that from what I've learned, it tends to be free swimming when the lights are out. And so I think I'll be running the UV at night. And if I do that, I'm not warming up the tank 24 hours a day. You know, it's an eight watt UV, so that's not a lot of wattage, but it's a 27 gallon aquarium. So running it for 10 or 12 hours a night might be enough that it doesn't really affect the tank temperature. That's what I will report back to say if it did or didn't. Okay. Um, uh, what the front area of the tank where the sand touches the glass. A lot of times the front of a brand new tank, it you just see the grains and it's really, really pretty. It looks very pristine. And then uh, and us, you know, we, we see pictures of people's tanks and a lot of times we can quickly judge the age of the tank based on what the sand looks like against the glass. And we can say, oh, the tank's way too new. You shouldn't have put all those creatures in. We just know. And like, how do you know that? I'm like, we can tell by the sand. <laughs> but as your tank becomes more mature, that area between the grains of sand and the glass gets dirtier. Uh, you might see worms traveling through it. You might see pockets. Uh, I've seen areas where literally bubble algae, uh, the valonia, was growing under the sand bed. I'm like, why would you grow down there away from the light? That's so weird. And I'd be reaching in there and scooping out bubble algae. Um, but a lot of times it turns pinkish. It's basically a version of cyano blooming between the grains of sand on the glass. And that area there kind of looks dirty and ugly. And a lot of times when you um, are visiting aquariums that are maintained by a, a aquarium maintenance service, when they go and they do all their work, they will literally clean the front edge. And you see, that's where I want to mention, because a lot of people think, well, I can't touch my sand bed because I'll hurt it. I'll damage it. I'll, I'll cause chaos. I'll release sulfur. I'll do these things. You won't. You can definitely clean the front edge. Uh, one of the easiest ways that I've ever cleaned it was to use a spatula and just take that and just rub it between the sand and the glass and just kind of use the, the rubber edge and kind of erase the glass. And so you're probably churning up about an inch of sand along, you know, between the glass and the sand bed itself. And you can totally go do that all the way around the rim and make your tank look so much better immediately. It's just such a nice, easy thing to do that um, no one really thinks about, but it makes a world of difference when you look at the tank. And whenever I finally get around to doing it, like for example, I'll show you the tank. Uh, let's, let's look at this video. And let me turn on my microphone. <laughs> oh, you can't see the sound of it. All right, let me try a different video. Um... This one here. Okay, so here you can see the sand bed and you can see there's like this blackish stuff. It's really a deep red that's happening on the far left and it's happening along the front on the uh, from the midpoint all the way to the right. It's just disgusting. And then on the side that faces the kitchen, it's the same way. So when I get up on the walkboard, I can take a spatula and I can go scrape that area and I'll end up having nice white sand against the glass and the, the whole tank will look better again. So that's why I'm telling you, you want to do this. It's actually a really good thing to do from time to time. And it's not something you have to do every week. It, it's something you could do probably once a month, once every two months, absolutely every six months, once a year. Once you do it, you're like, wow, that looks so much better. I should do that a little bit more often. So I would just uh, encourage you to not be scared to do that. You can totally clean that area. You will not affect the sand bed. You will not kill the bacteria. You will not release something vile into the tank that will harm all your fish and corals. Um, you are literally just kind of erasing the little bit of foul algae growth that's happening between the glass and sand. And the whole tank will just look cleaner. Uh, I used to strip and wax floors for a living. And I would come into these places of business or residential as well, but mostly business. And I would, you know, the floors would be terrible. 
and then I'd go, you know, I'd make the bid. They'd say, okay, we'll hire you. I'd come in there and I, I'd put down stripper. I'd, I'd dissolve or emulsify the, the current stuff on the floor. I would scrub it with a buffer and then I would shot vac it all out with a huge uh, walk behind wet vac. And then I would mop, mop, mop. And then of course it was dry and I'd put down my uh, high gloss wax uh, in multiple coats. And then finally it was dry. I could then put all the furniture or the, uh, the um, not appliances, whatever. I'd put the things back uh, where they where they were before I arrived. And they'd walk in the next day and like, wow, the place looks so much better just because of the floors. <laughs> and the floors make a huge difference. And the same thing with the sand bed. The sand bed can be a huge difference of a tank that looks good versus one that doesn't. There, uh, this maintenance of the aquarium, I've talked about several things. So having the, cl the cleanup crew in there to keep it all nice and churned up, to having the beneficial bacteria to keep it healthy and alive, to uh, doing the occasional gravel vacuuming to remove detritus that is getting trapped within the sand bed, which is 100% natural and should be happening and does happen, not only from just feeding and fish poop falling on the bottom. It isn't just migrating down uh, on its own for some weird reason. There are actually little worms in your sand bed um, I think they're Cheopterids. I'm doing this off memory, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But what it is, is you have this, this worm that lives in the sand bed, and it puts out two tentacles. And one tentacle goes like this, <laughs> and one goes like this. And they, they, this, the tentacles, I, I'm going to do it this way, they're almost like lying down on the sand and kind of just twitching around. But where they combine into this one tube, the tube is actually mucus, and sand grains to create this tube, sort of like the tube of a feather duster, but this is not a feather duster at all. It's a totally different worm with two tentacles. And these two tentacle uh, critters can send out a tentacle 10 times their body length. I mean, it can be a super long like string, spaghetti, whatever you wanna call it. And they're looking for things to eat off the sand bed. They might be looking for the waste from the fish, uh, excess food that wasn't consumed, uh, whatever. and. But the thing is, the, the tentacles that came out of the sand bed, they're capturing food and they're sending it to the worm that lives in the sand bed. And what does the worm do? It poops out what it didn't need anymore into the sand bed. So that could be also why you have some detritus build up within the sand bed from the creatures themselves that live in the sand that are excreting waste. So it's not just you didn't get all the dirt out of the tank, there's critters down there that are living and eating and wasting and also getting the sand bed dirty. So going in there from time to time and uh, cleaning it is logical. Uh, will you lose those worms during the gravel vac system? Probably some, maybe, I guess. I I've never tried to screen what I siphoned out. I just siphoned it out, poured it down the driveway, and I was done. Um, another creature that if you can get your hands on, actually there's two. There's the spaghetti worm, which I love. I think they're beautiful. And then there's, I think called terabellid, which is sort of looks like a spaghetti worm, but is actually a little different. And those two guys can definitely be in your sand bed. And they, again, worm lives in the sand and puts out these tentacles. The spaghetti worm's cool because it puts out like, I don't know, 10 or 12 uh, uh, tentacles. And the tentacles are segmented in colors. So it's got like yellow and orange and, and I think brown and then orange and yellow and brown. I mean, it's colorful. And so they're kind of cool. And I know some people don't like spaghetti worms. I actually think they're really cool. Uh, I think I've said that too many times. Um, I really like them. And so if you can get your hands on some or if you see some in a guy's tank and you're like, I don't like them, I'm like, I'll take them. Just say that. Just say, I'll take them. Give me some. And they're easy to get because you see where they are. You just scoop that spot and... Even if they grab some of the sand with it, then you get some beneficial bacteria and the spaghetti worm. You're winning on every level and then put it in your tank. Now, you may have other fish in the tank that will eat them, which is a possibility. Rasses probably will eat them. Uh, uh, Long-nosed butterfly fish or a copper band. Both those fish are prone to eat worms <laughs> and could possibly eat them. But, you know, if you have a, let's say you had a really cool sun coral tank like I did back in the day, having spaghetti worms in there was awesome because you're, it's a very heavily fed tank and you got these worms also helping eat uh, food that wasn't consumed. And so having them in there, I think is cool and they're helping keep the sand bed clean. So that's another creature that's not something you just easily buy. 
That one, you might have to go to a company like Indo-Pacific. I think they were the ones that had like their really strange stuff. But usually you get it from another hobbyist or maybe you get lucky and you happen to spot them at the fish store and you could say, I want that. So I would look for that as an additional thing you could add. Um, and I think that's everything. I think I covered it all and I did it in an hour. I'm proud of myself <laughs> because I did this one completely from memory. I didn't have any notes at all on this one, which I normally do. Now I'm gonna come to your questions next, but I wanna do something here in the middle of this video. Um, that's really important and I'm going to ask you I mean last week I had an important topic I wanted you guys to focus on and I hope that some of you did I hope all of you did uh, We do not want laws being passed that will completely cripple the saltwater industry uh, with stupid rules that the government suddenly um, Puts into place because we were silent. So if you did not follow that topic uh, Recently and get into it, please do go back to that video Find out what you can do to contact your House of Representatives your congressman uh, to let them know you're against the uh, Saving Nemo Act, I think it was called. Uh, it's, God. Anyway, don't let me, don't let me go down that rabbit hole. Uh, I want you guys to do something else this week. I want you to look in your bank account. <laughs> I want you to look in your wallets. I want you to look in your, your jar of change that you've been saving. I want you to see how much money you've got squirreled away. And then I want you to consider going to your local fish store and buying something if all of you would go out to your store and buy something to help them stay in business um that would be a wise decision i know we are getting more and more away from each other you know we have companies like amazon that deliver to your house to your door immediately there's lots of online vendors where you can buy things the fish stores are literally the lifeblood of the hobby and always have been how did you get your aquarium in the first place? Did you really buy everything online and you never walked into a store? You never went to an aquarium? You never saw anything in real life? You just were watching YouTube videos and like, I want an aquarium? Is that really what happened? Or did you go somewhere, you saw things, and you're like, I really want that, and they sold it to you? That's how you got started. And uh, invariably, a lot of hobbyists, as they stay in the hobby longer and longer, start finding ways to save money. And I get it. <laughs> I completely get it. But that being said, I probably spend $100 a month at Frank's Tanks, uh, the fish store by my house, all year long. So he's making $1,200 a year off of me just in frozen fish food. Um, and, you know, occasionally, like, I'll get something else like, uh, you know, sometimes I get livestock, sometimes I uh, um, a test kit, you know, those kind of things. Uh, the UV. I needed this very specific UV. I called up Frank and said, Frank, can you get me this UV? And he says, no, I can't get that, but I can get you Coralife. I said, no, I need this one. And he's like, well, why don't you like Coralife? And I just said, it's not going to work. And he said to me, well, you just put it on your sump. I said, it's going on the tank that has no sump. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's not going to work. I'm like, I know. I really need this one. Can you get it? If you can't, I will order it online, but I'd like to support your store. And he called me back and he said, I checked my other wholesaler list and they had six in stock. I've placed my order, it'll be here Wednesday. And that was on Monday. And on Wednesday, he texted me pretty much early in the morning, he says, it's here. And I that day I went over there and I bought my UV from him instead of buying it online. Now look, I run an online business and I ask you guys to buy things from me. Um, that's how I stay in business, that's how I pay the bills, that's how I keep the electricity on and you know all the things. But I also am asking you to support your local fish store in some form or fashion because they absolutely need you to come in and spend some money because they're paying a ton of money in the rent of their location, the utility bills that are ridiculously much higher than what it costs to run a business out of your home. They have employees, they have insurance, they have a lot of expenses and they are all struggling. Every single store <laughs> Across this nation, and I'm, I know I'm talking to an international audience, so maybe you're having the same problems over there in Europe, I don't know, um, and Australia, and I don't know, and uh, you know, um, Scotland, I don't know. But the stores need your money to keep being open. And so I'm asking you to proactively spend some money with them this upcoming week or this weekend to you know buy some fish food, buy some test kits, see if there's a coral you like, whatever you can do to help bring in some money because everyone is feeling this crunch. Um, the economy is not good and it's uh, it's affecting 
everything across. And yes, everything's costing more than ever did before. You have less uh, spending money. So that's why I was saying if you have a jar full of money <laughs> that you've been just throwing coins in, it's time to roll those coins. Oh, I got 32 bucks. I'm going to Frank's Tanks. I'm going to my uh, House of Fish. I'm going to my whatever store it is that's near you. Poseidon's Reef. I don't know. And just say, uh, I need to buy something and help them. And if you want to tell them that you were told this on this video, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to get credit. I'm trying to help these guys stay open because I've been getting phone calls from companies uh, just saying, how is it in your area? Because it's terrible here. And uh, usually the winter months is when the stores make really good money because during the summer, hobbyists are less prone to work on their aquariums. They're enjoying vacations. They're, they're doing water sports. They're... Uh, they're outside enjoying life, but in the winter they hibernate and they work on their aquarium and they buy more things for their aquarium. And stores are struggling uh, November, December, January, now we're in February, and they are just, sales are really, really down. And so we hobbyists, I'm saying that we have to be that uh, takes a village mentality and that the village needs to make sure that this business doesn't go away. And so if you can do your small part, if you know a few other hobbyists that don't watch this channel and you can tell them the same thing, hey, let's just go buy a few things from them this week, um, they will really appreciate it. And so I, I've always encouraged you guys to support the local fish stores. And local fish stores are where you find Coral Magazine, by the way. Uh, if you're not getting a subscription, which you should subscribe today. But if you're not, um, you should be able to get it at your store. And if you're not able to get it at your store, if you could ask them to contact us, we'll be happy to send some issues to them so you can get them at that store as well. So there's a lot going on there. All right, that's it. Let's go ahead and jump into our Q&A section. And I'm gonna take a look at these comments and see where we're at. And I'm gonna go ahead and move this thing over so I can kind of keep an eye on the screen too, because now I've got this camera. And I'm, give me a second here to look at the questions. Uh, Winterwater says, I started my reef without sand. I love how easy it is to see and clean away the detritus, but to this day, I still think how nice it would be to look at it with sand. The, uh, the, that is one of the benefits of a sandless aquarium is that you see the detritus, and so you can more readily siphon it out. There are different uh, ways of making sure the detritus goes all to one spot in the tank, you know, by selectively or, or in, um, intentionally pointing the flow to make it gather into a certain corner, so to speak. And then you could once a week siphon out that pile of detritus. And that is one method that uh, bare bottom aquarists do like. They like to siphon it out. But see, when I look, I just, because <laughs> I see the detritus. I don't want to see that. I It, it kind of bugs me. It kind of spoils the reef for me. Just like frag racks spoil the reef for me. I don't like seeing them in the tank. I really don't like the frag rack that's hanging in the back of Caitlin's reef right now. But with the dino situation going on, I didn't feel good putting all those zoanthids down low where po possibility of uh, the toxins of the dino flagellates could affect them. Now, they all seem to be okay on that rack. They, they're they opening, they're pretty, they're colorful, which is a good sign. But at the same time, I hate the look of the frag rack in there, just like I hate a bare bottom tank. <laughs> I have a very strong opinion about bare bottom tanks. Um, Mitch says, I personally love both. My last tank was sand. My current tank is bare bottom. It's an SPS tank. And the tank I'm installing next will be sand again for LPS. Uh, Becca Bits says, sand dwelling critters and good flow are like magic for keeping a clean sand bed. Oh, thank you for bringing up flow because I, I mentioned it, but I didn't quite mention this. The sand that you choose to buy can the grains, the, the size of the grains will react to the flow. So if you have oolitic sand, which is super, super fine grains, tiny, tiny dust, dust-like sand is the worst when it comes to flow in the tank. And I remember when people were buying South Down sand to put in their aquarium, it was calcium-based, it would dissolve in vinegar, it was considered the premier sand to use in your tank, and it, I mean, it looked like sandblasting sand to me, which by the way, sandblasting sand is not a good choice. So don't use that. But uh, the oolitic sand, it just, it, it looked almost like mud, which is kind of normal. That's what you would find on the, in, in the ocean. But I didn't really like the look, but boy, did it hate flow. 
And, you know, you could just take a turkey baster and just be, like, blowing off the rocks and accidentally squirt the sand and poof, this dust just rise. And you're like, oh, my God. And then people are using filter socks trying to catch as much of the lightest of the oolitic sand to uh, remove it from the system entirely so that way the rest of the heavier sand tended to stay in the tank. And that method of trapping it, they'd put filter socks, they'd put basically rags in the baffles to trap the oolitic, the, the lightest of the light, and remove as much of that as possible. And they'd complain for, you know, it takes weeks for this sand, this water to become clear again. That's one of the reasons I, I just did not like it. Um, but uh, the sand that I'm using now is by a company called Tropic Eden, and it's called Reef Flake, and it looks like sand. It just does. But it's slightly bigger. And according to the packaging, I've never actually tried to measure it, which might be interesting <laughs> now that I have a microscope. But uh, the sand grains are apparently two to three millimeters each. And by being just a little bit bigger than oolitic sand, flow doesn't blow it around like it did in the, back in the day. Um, and now I'm not talking about crushed coral. Crushed coral is a completely different thing. It's way more coarse. It's, um, it was something used in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, and it will work as a substrate, and it's common in freshwater. It's it was common in saltwater fish only systems, but it's not good for the cleanup crew. It's definitely not good for fish that sleep in the sand because it's really hard on their their uh, scales. So like wrasses that dwell in the sand. Oh, and that's a whole other topic about sand beds. Wrasses, <laughs> they dive in. Okay, and uh, but the crushed coral tends to trap a lot of waste rapidly and it's one of the ones that you would have to siphon regularly because it's so much waste in there that does not get processed properly and again it's usually like a half an inch to an inch deep and you could just siphon it weekly and continue to pull out brown 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 all the time you would never have like an off week it would just always be brown and it would just create nitrate like crazy so that's why we don't use crushed coral in the aquarium and it's just too darn big and then, yes, it's too sharp, too hard on all the animals. It's too sharp for cucumbers, too sharp for uh, conchs, it's too sharp. I mean, all, you know, Nasarius, Nasarius wouldn't even sleep in it, probably. That's that's a hunch, not a get, not a fact. Um, it's, just, it's just the wrong substrate entirely for the kind of stuff we do in a reef tank. But um, wrasses that sleep in the sand are also going to be a part of stirring the sand, sand bed a little bit. They aren't like picking it clean and trying to eat out all the life out of it, but the wrasses do dive in and it's kind of fun because they will find a spot they call home. So unfortunately, they're not like sleeping everywhere in the sand bed to where everything's getting turned up, you know, through a cycle of from day to day, week to week, month to month, you know, the wrasses have worked their way through the tank and it's all been tumbled. That's not what happens. Usually a wrasse will find a spot it likes and then it learns your lighting schedule learns it to the second the craziest thing ever man i just i love how predictable wrasses are and i used to have something called the lemon meringue wrasse it lived in my tank it was a, a long yellow wrasse with a white belly that's why it's called lemon meringue and um, it's different from the yellow chorus wrasse the yellow chorus wrasse is all yellow with a couple black dots the lemon meringue wrasse was yellow with a white belly and i think they came from australia but anyway that fish as it, my lights at that time were turning off at, I think, 9.30 because I worked nights, so there's no reason I have lights on late. My schedule was different with the lighting schedule, and by 9.30, the tank was going dark. And at, like, 9.29 and 50 seconds, <laughs> that wrasse would, you know, that had been everywhere in the tank, suddenly would just go down to the substrate and just stay in one and just kind of do the circle thing. And then literally, as you could hear the timer go click, the wrasse would just into the sand and just be gone invisible every night i could i could wait there and watch and at 9 40 i'm sorry 9 29 and 45 seconds the wrasse is down at that chosen spot circle 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 and then and like goes dark it's crazy how it knew i just knew exactly what time it was and i i don't actually um i never tried to see how the wrasse adapted to daylight savings time you know where we all change our clocks forward or back an hour i don't know how it learned the new time or how it, it figured out okay lights are different now than they were before i'm gonna adapt and then suddenly it just knew that exact time again because it did 
But I remember I got a, another yellow, cor I'm sorry, yeah, a yellow coarse wrasse from a friend. They were breaking down a tank. They needed a good home for it. And they said, would you take this fish? I said, yes. And then they reached out to me, I don't know, two, three weeks later and said, how's that doing? I said, I never see it. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, I never see it. I don't know where it is. I have no idea. And it's not a small fish. I just, I never find it. And then, you know, I, I called him like, oh my God, guess what just happened? I was walking past the tank and there it was. And, and they're like, oh. They're like, oh, and they told me, I know what happened. And I said, okay, what? They said, we had a nocturnal schedule. We actually ran our lights on that tank all night. And your schedule is daytime. So that fish is still on the nocturnal schedule. I was like, that would explain why I never see it. <laughs> and then gradually over the, and so now I'm cognizant about this fish. And I'm actually looking for it in the morning, you know, morning being 11 o'clock. I'm looking for it around noon and I'm just like, haven't seen it yet. And then four or 4.30 suddenly I'm seeing it swimming around everywhere for, you know, until like 9.30, 10. And uh, then after a few weeks of me, you know, watching, I guess a few weeks later, it was, you know, like 11.30 in the morning and there was the fish and it had learned the new schedule. It had changed its internal clock craziest thing ever but um it's really neat that they know time so well because none of them wear wristwatches none <laughs> okay uh triggerfish says that they are using uh for their sand bed the sand conch brittle starfish serpent starfish two cucumbers lots of necessary snails diamond goby and your favorite sand sifting star shouldn't be doing that <laughs> and i do and relapse reefer says sand beds look nice and support some interesting critters that's true and in a bare bottom tank you literally are eliminating those critters i mean you just can't keep them they're you are cheating your system of some of those animals because they're not an option and bare bottom tank owners a lot of them want to have wrasses and they have to choose the wrasses that sleep in the rock work and not sand dwellers or they have to take like a container and fill it with sand and stick it in the back corner of the tank behind the rock work so the fish can go find that little litter box to jump into at night to sleep it's just one of those things reef keeper says at least you got rid of that first scratch out of the way quickly Lucky you don't have to look at it anymore. Well, I looked at that scratch every day for 13 months, but then when the tank leaked, they, and you know what's funny? I, I don't think I've mentioned this before on, on this channel, but when they rebuilt the tank, um, they sent it back to me seven months later and they put the good glass on the back and they put the bad glass, which is the green glass on the front. The kind that looks like a little bit like a Coke bottle. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, when I unpacked the tank and we, dragged it in, you know 10 of us brought it into the house and we put it on the stand the 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 uh standard glass was on the the viewing side and the starfire was on the back which i could only appreciate from being in the fish room and i was super annoyed at it but you know what the the green glass didn't have the scratch <laughs> and the scratch that bothered me so much on the starfire was now in the back and i was like well at least the scratch is gone but I just couldn't stand that I was looking my tank through this green tinge. And I keep saying green. It's not green. It's just, it's not low iron. It's standard glass. And standard glass gives you a little bit of a green tint to your entire reef, which is why I only set up tanks with Starfire. And to have this tank with my Starfire in the back, which is like, are you kidding me? I mean, this sucks. And I was really upset. And it was Saturday morning. I'm looking at it, you know, because that's when everyone came over to help me bring it in. And then Sunday... And finally, Monday morning, or, or maybe two in the morning, Sunday night, I was like, dear Marineland, I am so unhappy. I mean, thank you for fixing my tank, but oh my God, why is the Starfire on the back? This is such a problem. And I know you fixed it and I appreciate it, but oh my God. And I said, could you at least in the future, when you have to fix a tank for a customer, put a giant post-it on the glass at Starfire and say front panel so you don't do this to any other customers? And uh, late, and then I went to bed. You know, I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> just disgusted. And the next day I got a phone call from the vice president of the company saying, Mark, what did you do wrong? <laughs> I'm just like, what did I do wrong? And he's like, what did you do? I'm like, I didn't do anything. He goes, exactly, it's our fault. I'm sorry, we'll fix it. And he said, we're just gonna make you a new tank. 
And I was like, what about this one? And he says, you can do whatever you want with it. You can donate it, you can sell it, you can break it, you can, you know, whatever you want. And so I ended up selling it dirt cheap to somebody local in the club, and uh, he, he didn't mind the scratch. And I think the front panel, which was the back, was like the front for him in his house or something. It just worked. But um, I said, hey, I've got a suggestion. I'm telling the vice president this. And he says, what's that? I said, put Starfire on all three sides so this doesn't happen again. And he says, done. Which I totally did not expect him to say yes to. I, I was just going to... I, I thought he'd chuckle because, you know, I was sort of joking, but at the same time, kind of serious. And uh, so the tank that you guys have been enjoying for the last 10 years, um, you know, that you've been following for all this time on YouTube, that's the one with Starfire on all three sides. And I have, in the meantime, some other scratches that have happened over the years. But for a 10-year-old tank, the glass is in really good shape. I've taken really good care. I've tried at, as much as possible to avoid scratching the glass. Still scratch it occasionally, but uh, for the most part, I've done good. I've seen way worse. Uh, back in the day when I had my 29-gallon, we had a, a guy in our club who was a really good photographer. And I said, can you come over and take pictures of my tank because I just love your work? And he did. And then he says, oh, my God, Mark, your glass could not have more scratches if you tried. I mean, it's like the whole thing is just scratches. I'm like, really? Because, you know, I wasn't paying attention to it. And because um, this we're talking about, like, 2002, 2003, 2004. I don't know. No, 2002, 2003, because I took the tank down in 2003. And he said, I have spent so much time in Photoshop erasing those scratches. Like, I'm never, I will never do a tank like this again. If I come to the house and I see the scratches, I will just say sorry and leave. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay. And, and then once he brought it to my attention, I was like, holy crap, he's right. There's a ton of scratches. And so then I was super aware of it when I was taking pictures of my tank to share. And I'd be fixing things that were obviously ruin, you know, ruining the image to make sure that the subject was pretty. But yeah, it's tedious. And so having the glass not scratched should be your top paramount goal of your aquarium at all times. Rick, so glad to see you. He says, joining late but excited for the show. Becca Bits says, I add about a third of the cleanup crew that I think I need at the time and see how they do over a three to four week period before adding more. That's not a bad system. That's actually a pretty good system because what it does is it allows you to uh, not put too many creatures in there. And then if you say, hey, they're not keeping up, it's not doing good enough, then you, know, you can put in some more and you know, hopefully get that algae that's growing in your tank under control. Protex Remodeling says, my red leg hermits rock. I bet they do. Oh, thanks, Mitch. I was wondering about that one. He said uh, he had a black cucumber for several years, and it moved quite a bit and would scale the glass. Uh, he says, though, I learned after that the black one's defense mechanism can be toxic to humans. Wow, I didn't know that either. Thank you for telling me. Let me fix this camera. It's a little bit low. All right, that's better. Stay. <laughs> um... EIY says, uh, yesterday I took three or four rocks out of my refugium and the rocks were half black like coal. I washed the rocks in sand and should I throw them in the refugium or not use them again? You would, I would love to see these. I'd like to see pictures. If you can go to Club Milo's Reef and put them in the group for us to look at, that would be great. Here, let me throw this on the screen. It's probably going to hide behind everything. <laughs> it sure is. Move this down. Move this down. So Club Milo's Reef is my group on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And if you're not a member yet, um, just apply, answer the three questions, and I will approve you. And then post the pictures. I want to see them. You should take the rocks and you should smell them. And if they smell clean like the ocean, they're usually safe to use. You said that you, what was the word you used? Washed. I don't know what washed mean, but it makes me nervous. If you mean rinsed or shook off in salt water like crazy, that's good. If you mean garden hosed and fresh water dipped and all that kind of thing, might not be safe to put in your refugium. So let's get some more facts. You know, you can, you know, ask more questions here in the chat, or um, you can get a conversation going in Club Milo's Reef. But I do know that taking rock that's been outside or, you know, has been cleaned up outside and then brought back into the house and put in the aquarium, 
doesn't always work so well for the system and you just you can see the system suddenly seems declining you know the tank just the corals are usually nice and puffy seem to be wilted <laughs> because something new is now in the system rock even though it is rock is porous and the stuff that you're rinsing out and the stuff that died off because it was exposed to air and stuff inside the rock that was ex essentially exposed to fresh water and air can be a die off and then you put it back in your system and the salt water permeates all that rock and it releases all those things that were semi-toxic and it, it could kind of cause a mini cycle uh, there could be a slight spike there could be uh, just things are not like they were so uh, let's get a better conversation about that rock before you put it back in the system but that is, it doesn't mean it's ruined not necessarily it might be that you just put it in a barrel or bucket of salt water with a large pump and just let it circulate for three or four weeks and let it just kind of and change water a couple of times in that bucket and then after about a month, it might be totally ready to be put back in the refugium. But I'd really like to see it first because the fact that it was black was kind of weird. Uh, Mike says, we took our UV offline for almost a year just to be more natural, quote unquote. Uh, in our experience in our system, both the glass and the sand got dirtier much quicker. UV is back on and the tank is cleaner. Thanks for sharing that with me. I appreciate it. Uh, I've tended to find that a tank that gets carbon run on it once a month uh, will usually clarify the water nicely immediately. And like the next day, the tank looks much more clear. And then gradually over some time, it just becomes less clear. And then it's time for fresh carbon. But I usually recommend three days of carbon in the aquarium is enough for the tank. And then really take the carbon offline. Just remove it and, uh, and clean everything, get it ready for next month. And then when you're ready to run the reactor again, you do. That's how I recommend uh, doing it. I've never personally owned a UV until now. And so I'm going to figure out how I'm going to plumb it onto Kate's tank. Like I said, I didn't have any time to touch it yet. I would have loved to have hooked it up. In the meantime, what did I do with the tank to deal with these dinos? Uh, I cleaned the glass because, you know, the glass was getting kind of dirty. I did fill up the cartridge that the Shark Pro, they have a, an add-on kit that has this little like compartment that you lift the lid off, you fill it up with carbon, you put the lid on, you rinse it in the sink to make sure no black dust comes out. You plop it into the square cube, you put the sponges on both sides, you slide the lid on, and you put it in the tank. It's a whole ordeal. And then once you've done that, it will then start to absorb you know, the yellowing of the water. It will absorb toxins, which the dinos are putting out. So I thought that was smart. And I'm going to change that carbon today. I did it a week ago, and I'm just going to change it because I'm dealing with something extra foul in a tank that has no protein skimmer. And I want to make sure that this stuff that's in there is being uh, is not just poisoning the water and the livestock. Um, I've been watching carefully at like the hermit crabs that are in the tank, the Neisseria snails. Are they dropping dead from touching this stuff? And they're not, which is great because some dinos are super toxic and you just end up losing your cleanup crew. Um, another thing that I did was I put in BioDigest in the tank because that was a beneficial waste consuming bacteria that um, was recommended in the dinoflagellate group. I have been putting in phytoplankton, which I'm using Easy Reef's phytogel, and you just take, well, you're supposed to measure it, but I'm not that kind of hobbyist. <laughs> I have a, again, I have so many of these specimen cups from buying frags over the years, and so I just have a stack of them. And so a lot of times I'll use a specimen cup and I'll take some tank water and I'll mix in Benarif, which by the way, I'm wearing that on my shirt today. Um, I put Benarif in there and I pour it in to feed the Gorgonian. Well, I grabbed a different cup and I put in a blob of the phytogel, which um, it's supposed to be a milliliter, but I didn't actually measure it. Felt like it was probably a little bit more than it needed to be. And then I added RODI water to it and I stirred it till it became like phytoplankton and wasn't just a jelly blob of phyto. And um, then I poured that in the tank and I did phyto in the tank every day for the last few days. And that plus the carbon plus the biodigest seems to have lessened the amount of brown that I'm seeing on the sand bed. So I'm assuming that my final stage will be to put the UV on the tank. And that way, because it only appears during the light cycle, and then, you know, at night it seems to vanish because it's all swimming. <laughs> Weirdest thing ever. And as I'd almost love to capture some of that. I wonder if I can capture some night water and stick that under the microscope and see these magic things. I don't know. I have no idea because I've not asked that question, but I heard they're free swimming at night, and that's why you turn on the UV to get them, 
to pass over the bulb. Because if they're sticking to the sand, how does a UV bulb and a thing hanging off the back of the tank or sitting in, you know, somewhere in the sump system, how on earth would it affect these? It can't. It needs to be whatever is moving around through the water column. So that's, uh, that's my battle. That's where I'm at for now. Um, Jenny says that her copper band, I think, I don't know. I assume Janny's a woman. Uh, her copper band ate, did eat the worms. So I'm thinking we're talking about the spaghetti worms and the terabellids and those kind of things. They, yeah, worm eaters, fish that eat worms are going to look for worms that are in your system. Bommy said that they put their UV back on their reef as well. Took it off for the same reason, kept it looking natural, but the end it's just better to have. Yeah, I, can you imagine if I had to put a UV on my 400 gallon? It would be so expensive. Because <laughs> it had to be really big. And uh, I don't necessarily want to pay for that. Let me. So I'm going to take this thing back off the screen if I can find it. I'll put this up there in the meantime. Nope, not this one. This one. If you guys can shop at, you know, I talked about supporting the fish stores. Uh, also this week, if you could happen to buy something from Mila's Reef, I'd appreciate it. Um, I sell all kinds of aquarium supplies, the things I use in my own aquarium. Uh, I sell foods. I sell uh, all kinds of... Uh, plumbing fittings. I sell Apex gear, hydro gear. Uh, I sell acrylic things that I build for customers. There's a lot of choices. So there's probably over 300 items. Feel free to go through and see if there's something you could use. Um, if you just want to support the channel and don't need anything for your aquarium, I sell coffee mugs and drinking glasses. Um, ideally, you know, I love shipping packages that have multiple items. Obviously, there's a margin of profit on each thing sold. And if you buy one thing, there's a little margin. If you buy 10 things, the margin's a little bit bigger, which is nicer. And, you know, I do appreciate the business you guys throw me. I think that you help keep me uh, keep me afloat, you know, no matter what happens. I really thought when COVID happened, I'd go out of business. I was like, well, who's going to take care of aquariums? They're going to worry about food and a roof over their head and electricity, you know. But, um, yeah. So, anyway, um, yeah, you can support your local fish stores and Milo's Reef. That's even better. <laughs> okay. Just a little plug for me. I'll go ahead and remove that. If I can find it again, where is it? There. Okay, okay. Uh, Martin says, would you recommend a laser for killing Aptasia? Um, I find that the laser does work, but at the same time, it also possibly will spread them. Um, I kind of think of it like fireworks because, you know, you, you have a firework that explodes and it just scatters sparks everywhere. And it seems like when we're killing Aptasia that the, uh, the crackling of the bacon might spawn out a bunch of little babies in that general area. I did encounter that a few times, but not always. But if you had peppermint shrimp, they would go ahead and they would uh, pick and eat what's left of the remains and they'd devour what's left. So if you have a teamwork thing going, that'll work. Now listen, Jack is going crazy, so I'm going to throw a video on the screen for a moment so I can answer my door and I will be right back. I'm back. Got a package for Jack. So, this right here. Oh, she's right here too. She can't wait. It's a gift from Caitlin's mother. It's a bandana for uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> here you go, Jackie. Hang on. Let me tie it on you. Hang on. Stay still. Oh, you silly dog. Come here. I know. All right. Come over here so I can see it. Let me look. Let me look. Oh, you look so cute. You are so pretty. All right. If she happens to walk that way, watch closely. <laughs> Let's see where she goes. Oh, she's going to lie down. Anyway, uh, she got one, and it was too small. 
So we had to get the next size up. And uh, I need to mail back the one that was the wrong size. That was nice. I actually thought that was me owing money to someone. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I mentioned to this to you guys last weekend, but I got a brand new driveway put in. And uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a huge slab of concrete. It's fantastic. I love it. And I finally can park on it. I had to wait a whole week for it to dry. And now that it's dry, I park on it, and I have this huge sidewalk. So when I open the car door and I get out, I'm getting out onto this nice sidewalk. I've never had that. I've lived in this house for 24 years. And that sidewalk, it was always one of those, I wish I had, and now I have it and I love it. But he hasn't been paid yet. And so each day he says, can I come around noon? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here. And he hasn't shown up each day. And so I texted him yesterday. I was joking. It's like, I'm loving this free driveway. <laughs> thinking that would give him like a reminder, come get your money. So I thought maybe he's here during the live stream because that's invariably how things happen. But it's not. What are you doing? They can hear that. Stop. Silly dog. All right, let me come back to this Q&A. I, I changed the camera angle in case you could see her, but, you know, Jackie. Let's see. Can we push this down? Where are you, Jack? Where are you? Oh, you can't see it. It's on her neck. Anyway, <laughs> I'll take a picture later and post it. Let me fix this, because I don't like anyone does that. Jackie, you're so cute. I love you. You are so pretty. All right. Nice. Infinite Reef said, I just spent $137 30 minutes ago. Awesome. Um, Protex Reef uh, Remodeling said, the problem is the fish store can't keep the inventory, and you're forced to buy from the online stores. Okay, that's true, but can you tell them I want this, and when can you get it? <laughs> that's another trick that I use um, unless it's pressing like I need a pump today like my whole tank's going to die in those situations you know you're probably going to buy online and you're going to pay overnight shipping and you need it like immediately in those scenarios yeah your store may not be able to help you they may though have that inventory in the back you know so it's worth asking the store if you can uh, get something from them uh, when I got Caitlin's aquarium I didn't just go to Amazon and find some tank I walked into a store and I, because I know how Frank is, he loves to talk. Uh, he, this is no secret. And uh, I said, Frank, I am a customer. I want to buy an aquarium. I want you to treat me like a customer and let's just get to it. <laughs> He's like, okay. I said, I need a small tank for a beautiful uh, pygmy angelfish. I was planning to set it loose in my tank, but it's so tiny. I feel like it's going to get chopped up by the Vortec. And so what can you get me tomorrow? And he said, Hang on. And he pulled some things up on his screen and he says, I can get you this tank tomorrow with a stand. I was like, done. And the next day I went there to his store and I picked up my tank and stand. So was it immediate gratification? No, but it was within 24 hours. When I needed the UV, I called him and says, can you get me this? He got back to me and he says, I can get you this. I was like, no. And the dinos were there. I needed to solve the problem. And uh, so I was kind of on the, th the thinking, I might just have to buy this online to get it quickly. But then on Monday, he says, I can get you the one you wanted. And I'm like, great. He says, it'll be your own Wednesday. I'm like, close enough. And so I said, yes. And he made some money. <laughs> so that's that's how it works. So if you, and if there's a certain fish food you like and the store doesn't have it, or if there's a fish you like and the store doesn't have it, or if there's a, a shrimp that you like, you can tell the store you need it. Just like you can tell the store, I want live rock. You know, you only sell dry rock. Well, I want live rock. Can you sell me that? And they'll go get it. I mean, that's literally what they do. If, if they can't sit on the inventory, which is a understandable thing in this economy, if you can be a little bit patient, that is one way to support them. And uh, you're just it's just working with them. You know, just giving them an opportunity to rise to the occasion. That's my thought. Um... Reefkeeper says, one of the local fish stores just closed his doors, couldn't afford the rent any longer. Uh, Janny says, Finland has the same problem for fish stores. Mitch says, I lost my local marine local fish store in December, sadly. Hey, Triggerfish says, everyone should buy the Smart Stir from Mark's shop. I just got mine and it's awesome. Yeah, I love that thing. I use it every time I test my water. I never want to hold a beaker and shake it. <laughs> I hate that. I Every single test goes into the Smart Stir. And I probably have 20 of them. So if, uh, let's see, there's 110 of you on here. 20% of you can get one today. <laughs> no, it, it's really wonderful. And um, 
I have not had to plug it into the computer or, you know, into a, a power supply to recharge it in six months. It's amazing how long the battery lasts in that thing. <laughs> now that I've said that, you're like, mine lasted a week. I don't know. All I can tell you is every time I need to use it, it works. And then eventually when you turn it on, the button turns uh, turns red, which means you need to charge it. And I stick it on one of those little uh, square chargers like we use for phones and plug it in. And, you know, a few hours later, it's re fully recharged and good again for months. And, you know, I can carry it anywhere I need to go. I can hold it up to the light. I mean, it's so convenient. And I, I just love using that stirrer. It's just, it's fantastic. <laughs> I cannot oversell that product. It is that good. And I've been recommending it for a long time. And, and I remember, it was, believe it or not, my supplier said that they are going to stop selling it. I'm going to go, how many do you have? And he says, uh, 500. I was like, well, I'm not going to buy 500. But, uh, you know, send me 20 or 40 of them. And so I've had those in my shop. And uh, they're, they're selling. But if you guys want one, now's the time to get one before they're gone. Uh, hmm. Stiviger? <laughs> Star Trek Voyager, maybe? Uh, says, uh, you were talking about the Spionidae worms. I just cleaned my seahorse tank. Uh, the sand bed and found a few that are four to six inches long. I was going to ask if they're a good thing to have. Yep, they are. They're, they don't hurt starfish. Or they don't hurt anything. They're not stingers. They're just food trappers. So yeah, they're beneficial. Uh, Winterwater says, what is that white paper sheeting like stuff that comes out of my plumbing? Um, that almost sounds like calcium precipitation possibly. I don't know. Uh, how big are these sheets you're talking about? I, I My brain is thinking plumbing and then a sheet of white paper coming out, <laughs> which I know you're not saying. But uh, sometimes it could just be calcium buildup that has become a solid, possibly from how the water is being dosed in the sump. And then it's just calcifying too quickly instead of being pro properly dissipated. And so you're seeing stuff. I'm not sure. Martin says, I just spent my money at the local fish store today. Yay! Frozen food and a new fish and a small copper band. Congratulations and thank you. I'm saying thank you for them, even though I don't even know what store that was. I just literally want us to comp uh, support our stores. And I thought, let's make it a team effort this weekend. Uh, Martin also says, do you recommend the laser? I think you might have asked that earlier. It does work, but um, FFTASIA totally works. The fact that it didn't work for you surprises me. So you and I might need to get together so I can talk with you because it works every time I use it. I use the crap out of it, and I use so much. I did a video showing how I used it. It might have been a uh, Reef Diary, and people are like, wow, I never used that much. I'm like, yeah, but my Aptasia never came back, and it was a huge one. That thing could have had a, a clownfish as a as a, a dweller. <laughs> you know, it was the clownfish host of all hosts. So um, it was really big and fat, and I wanted it gone, and I used a lot of FFTASIA to get rid of it. Uh, Trevor says, regarding spionid worms, has anyone seen them stunt the growth of frags? I have a Cali tort with several on the growth, several on the growth tip? And as of for four months. On the tip of the coral? Yeah, it doesn't belong on the tip. The tip's where the new growth goes. You don't want any kind of worms up there. If they were on the frag plug or on the rock nearby and you're like, there's a thing, you might move the Cali tort over a little bit. But if there's something in the actual coral itself, you might need to glue it shut. Um, Tom says, do you quarantine any sand critters? Nope, not at all. I don't quarantine cleanup crew either. Everything goes in. Atkins Nature Aquarium says, I don't like how easy it is to scratch low iron glass. Neither do I. And a lot of times I'll get a, an email from someone saying, hey, uh, what do you think about acrylic tanks? And my answer is always the same. You're going to scratch it. It's so easy to scratch that I, I just don't recommend it. I mean, all my tanks in my tank uh, in my house are glass, except for the frag tank. And, you know, of course, my sump and all the filtration, the things I build, all those are made of acrylic. But they are not my viewing panel. And I am so... I want low iron glass. I mean, I absolutely want that, which means it's super prone to scratching. 
Now Flipper has a really cool uh, glass scraper. It's a big long handle and you put in credit cards, gift cards, key hotel key cards, and they're plastic and they won't scratch glass because the plastic is softer than the glass. And so, um, and they come in different lengths. I only sell one size on my website, but they have like a super long handle and then they have a, a medium size and then a smaller size. And then you can just swap out cards as frequently as you need to, to do the job. I have also found that you can scrape acrylic on acrylic to clean acrylic and normally not scratch the tank. Um, I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I have done that in the past. I would basically take a piece of scrap acrylic, I'd hold it in my hand, I'd sharpen the crap out of it, <laughs> and then I'd go in the tank and I'd, I'd clean off like the front of my frag tank or I'd scrape inside my sump and it wouldn't scratch because they were equal density. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But in very, most of the time, I'm a big proponent of plastic on glass, I very rarely use metal on glass. I, you know, when I do, it's because I'm just so frustrated. I just don't care anymore. And uh, I have occasionally done that, and you know, of course, scratched the glass somewhat, which is unfortunate. Um, and uh, I use the handy razor blade in my. What is that thing called? I can't remember. It's too long, but there's a thing that you glue to the back of a mag float. And it uses a blade that literally says the word handy. <laughs> it's a type of razor blade. And I use that in my tank once a month. And I go over every inch of the glass on all three sides. And then I'll go do Caitlin's tank as well and get all three sides of that tank. And I clean off anything that's on there to get it back to as pristine as I can. And it's always a brand new blade. I don't use the same blade twice because I don't want to scratch my tank with a blade that has begun to rust and have a burr on it. It has to be a brand new oiled blade that I can then put in my tank. Uh, Mitch has all these comments. I'm going to share them. He said, when I bought my two, my current 220 gallon tank, I had a long conversation with the tank builders about scratching low iron versus conventional float glass. I was adamant that I wanted float glass because it didn't scratch easily. Apparently, chemically, they are the same hardness. Glass makers went down that rabbit hole and strongly believe they are the same in terms of scratching. The clarity just makes it far easier to see the scratch. That's interesting. Um, in this new issue of Coral Magazine that's coming out, there is a 6,340 gallon aquarium that's being featured. And it is made of two layers of glass that I Googled to find out more about. And it's a safety glass, it's tempered glass, <laughs> it's, uh, and it's because of the way it's been created it is five times stronger than float glass. And you think about it, it's an inch and a half. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the dimension. The glass is 19 millimeters each, and there's two of them. So it's 38 millimeters, which equates to an inch and a half thick glass to hold back 6,000 gallons of water. Now, my reef tank is three quarter inch glass for 400 gallons. He's using inch and a half. He's doubled my glass thickness for a much bigger volume. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm going to assume if I went to a thousand gallon tank, I'd use one inch. But if I had a 2000 gallon tank, I don't think I'd go inch and a quarter. And if I had a 3000 gallon tank, I'd probably go inch and a half. And he's got 6,430 gallons. It is nine feet long, 12 feet front to back, four and a half feet tall. It is a monster aquarium. And it's an inch and a half glass, it's crazy. So you should enjoy that story. So if you're not a subscriber to Coral Magazine, please buy a subscription today so you will be included in the subscriptions that get shipped out from the printer. It's really important you get that now. The subscription with the link that's in this video uh, description below, uh, that link, and uh, Andrea put it in the chat, will get you six issues, the next year's worth of magazines for $37. That is the price of a nice little frag. <laughs> that is um, a quarter of the price of a UV. <laughs> that is the price, less than the price of two packs of Rod's food. Um, I'm just, you know, and it is, I don't know, 1% of a Japanese pygmy angelfish. Uh, 
No, it's a fantastic magazine. The price is not expensive. If you were to buy these issues one at a time from the fish store, they're 10 bucks each. That's 60 bucks a year. And uh, we're offering it for $37 with my special link that even knocks, you know, brought the price down a little bit lower. Uh, if you just went to coralmagazine.com to subscribe, it would cost you $39. With mine, it's like $37.06. So, you know, get the subscription, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. I know I'm being pushy. I have to. I got to keep Matt's kids fed. Plus, I want you to see all the stuff I'm, t I'm reading and studying and editing to get it right for you guys. You guys are going to love this issue. It's got all kinds of cool stuff in it. Um, okay, what did I skip? I feel like I skipped one here. Nope, I did not. Reef Marshall says my tiger conch does a great job of keeping the sand bed clean. Janny says I, cr I scratched my acrylic tank. What polish, uh, what can I use to polish the, the acrylic? There's actually a, an acrylic polishing kit and it's not the chemicals, it's the different grades of sandpaper. And so you find yourself a kit. It'll have like multiple pieces of different grades of sandpaper and there's like this sponge and you will then wrap the sandpaper around the sponge and put your hand in the water and you will work the scratch. Basically, you're going to work the scratch this way, back and forth, back and forth, left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, over and over and over. And then you're going to take your sponge out. You're going to wrap the next finer sandpaper on there. So like, let's say the first one was, I'm just throwing a number out there, okay? I'm not saying use this to start with, but let's say it was 1800 grit. Then the next one will be 2200, which is a little bit finer. It's a little less rough. You wrap there on the sponge, and now you sand this way, up and down, 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 up and down. Then you take the sponge out, and now you go to 2800 sandpaper, and you put that on, and now you go side to side, side to side, side to side. And then you go to 3500, and you go up and down, up and down. And this is how you basically erase a scratch inside your aquarium. And it's very time consuming, it takes forever. It's not convenient. There's a guy um, that lives in Boston, had a absolute, has had, I don't know, still has a beautiful, unbelievable tank of the month tank years ago. And his routine every winter, when the weather was crappy, he would do the different grades of sandpaper around his cleaning magnet. And he would just work the acrylic to get rid of all the scratches. And because it was an acrylic tank, and then um, throughout the year, it would get scratched up. And I went to visit his tank in person because I'd seen it and it was fantastic. And I was speaking to the Boston Reefers Club and they said, Paul's in the area. I'm like, oh my God, we got to go to Paul's house. And we we literally showed up and just knocked on the door. He didn't even know we were coming. I mean, that's how, how blatant I was. Like, I have to see this tank in person. I've seen the pictures. It's amazing. And he was kind enough to let us in. He happened to be home. And I got to see the entire setup and I got to go downstairs and see the basement uh, where the crazy, he had some really interesting filtration that was not common, but um, he was really upset that his acrylic wasn't perfect. And I said, it's okay. He goes, no, you don't understand. I'm not embarrassed. I just finished my process of like cleaning all the acrylic of scratches, but I got this new fish, an angel fish, and it has these spines on his cheeks. They're called, they're called cheek spines. And they're basically like, porcupine quills and it has been going up to that spot on the glass like seeing its reflection and hitting the cheek spine and chopping up the acrylic and he's like that area is now all full of slices after i just fixed it all for the year and i'm like i have to go do that all over again because of this fish i'm so upset and i was like oh that is not one i would have anticipated i've always been you know like don't scratch the acrylic i never thought about a fish scratching <laughs> the walls of the tank how crazy is that um, Winterwater says, what is the painting behind you of the dolphin? So, it's actually not a dolphin. Let's see if I can do this without too many reflections. So, and I'm in the picture. How, how do I get this in here? Get it closer to me, right? Um, I can't do it. I can't do it. It won't cooperate. So, it's a diver with a mermaid. And it was painted by Susan. I think it says Dove. I'm trying to read it. Hang on. D-A-W-E. I got this at Comic-Con last year. And I loved it because she's an actual diver and she got the fish accurate. So I was like, uh, I got to have this. And so I bought it. And I still need to get it out of plastic. And I need to get it framed and put it up on the wall. But yeah, it's really nice. And then it's got some manta rays. And Jack is down here. Let's see if I get down here low if you get to see her friendly. There's Jackie. Hi, Jackie. 
And here's her little neckerchief. She's so pretty. Filled with hearts for Valentine's Day. Such a good girl. I like this new webcam. It follows me. It's so cool. Super convenient. It lets me put it right here in line with the, uh, the questions. <laughs> Protex says, I put a rock outside every now and then just to kill the Aptasia. Oh, great. EIY, thank you for joining the group. I'll go ahead and I'll get that taken care of. I'll get you appro approved. I need to go through the list and actually see um, who's waiting. Carl is here. Hey, Carl, how are you doing? Grassman says, I just bought the Kessel 360 Power Cores. Awesome. I'm glad you bought some stuff from your store. Way to go. I'm really happy to see these, these comments. I mean, these stores rely on us to stay open. <laughs> nice. Michael says, I bought one tiger tail cucumber over a year ago, and now I have five of my 180 own. See how nice it is? You don't have to do anything. You buy one and you get more. That is how things should be. Let's see. Yeah, Jack did say FedEx was here. Actually, it was Amazon, <laughs> but you're close. FedEx, UPS, Amazon, she recognizes all those vehicles. Uh, AJT says, what are your thoughts on siphoning a sand bed when you have a sand sifting sea star or starfish? Well, I would say you shouldn't have that starfish in your tank. I mean, it's, that's the truth. I mentioned that earlier in the show. It's just, it's the, it's the wrong starfish for a saltwater tank. It eats everything. It eats the life out of your sand bed. It gives you a dead sand bed. And then the surface of your sand, while it's being churned over, it will start growing hair algae. It's the weirdest thing. Um, Huang says, I got hair algae that grows on the rocks like moss. How can I deal with that? I pick it off, but it's really, really hard. Yeah, the uh, hair algae growth, the first, I mean, here's my approach. It's really easy. You got three things to do. Number one, I use phosphate RX to knock the phosphate down in the tank. And then I reach in after three days and I peel off as much as I possibly can because the algae is weaker. The, the phosphate RX turned the phosphate in the water column into a solid. It turns it into, imagine, little tiny flakes. I've got to figure out how, far, how I can capture some of those flakes and stick them under my microscope. I want to see it. I keep thinking of things I can put under the microscope now that I've got one. As you can see, it's right there, right there above my head. Um, but it turns the liquid phosphate into a solid so it can be exported in a filter sock or into a protein skimmer. And then after th that phosphate's been removed, the algae becomes weaker. It's, it's being starved of one thing it's used to consuming. And then after three days, you can reach in and start pulling the hair algae out a lot more easily and then add the cleanup crew. You want hermit crabs and you want snails. And you put those in the tank and you literally put them on the algae itself. And then if you see some off somewhere else, you put them back on the algae where they're supposed to work because you don't want them scattering. You want them to focus on that algae. And if you have enough of them, they will consume it and uh, they will keep it under control. And you, you don't want them to like die off and just you have none because what happens then is, of course more nutrients are in the tank because you have fish, you have corals, you're feeding them and it's gradually growing. And so new algae will form. But if you don't have the little guys walking around and munching on it as it's appearing, it will get out of control. So we're, first we're trying to consume as, you know, the plethora you have now. And then we want to have enough cleanup crew to snack on new growth as it's happening to always keep it under control. So you want to replenish that cleanup crew from time to time. You, you don't want to just forget about it. You know, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy snails every six months, but you should keep aware of how many you have in the tank and how the tank is doing. And if the tank seems to be getting a little bit dirty, it might be time to go ahead and uh, add some more mouths to do some more mowing to keep things under control. Uh, Luke says, carbon dosing versus algae scrubbing, which is more effective? Well, carbon dosing is more readily designed to control nitrate and an algae scrubber is um i've heard can improve or reduce nitrate but i've never seen that happen to me specifically it is absorbing and utilizing the nutrients in the water column to help keep things from decaying and uh, they're kind of two different methods yeah i which one's more effective that's i gotta think about that 
they're two completely different approaches. One, you know, the algae scrubber would be a natural approach because you're growing plants. Carbon dosing, you're putting in a chemical. You know, you're putting in ethanol. So it's really a matter of which works better for you. Do you, do you have enough room for the right size scrubber that can keep up with your bio load? Where with carbon dosing, that's not a limiting factor. You can always put in more and more and more carbon to keep up with the ongoing demand of the tank. Where a scrubber is limited to the size of the screen. I mean, you're going to clean it every 10 to 12 days, 12 to 14 days, whatever it is. Uh, but there's only so much surface area. Now, uh, when I was looking, and we talk about algae turf scrubbers in this issue of Coral Magazine, because the whole magazine is about filtration, um, I noticed in several of the pictures I looked at, there was tanks with multiple scrubbers on one system or one, yeah, one body of water. So even in that scenario, they saw that one wasn't enough, but they needed two or three or four on that setup to handle the, the load of nutrients in the system. So I guess that's the difference. Uh, now, which is more effective? It comes down to the bio load. You know, what, what's going on with the tank? What's going on with the, uh, <clears throat> how much, <laughs> I know this sounds crazy. How many pounds of fish do you have? How many pounds of food do you put in? That was one of the things you'll see in the stories. Um, and uh, if the scrubber is big enough to handle it, where with carbon dosing, you're, you're not limited to size. I guess that's my answer. Uh, John says, what do you, you know, you said only run carbon for a few days. What about ChemiPure? ChemiPure apparently can work for uh, a month or two at a time. And so it is a completely different thing. And now, ChemiPure is not just carbon. It's carbon. It's a uh, GFO. It's got two different kinds of resin. Um, there's a lot of things in it. And um, there is a process of how to use it. Um, I don't think it's just drop in a bag and ignore it. I, and I'm not positive. I don't remember all the results, but uh, that actually was talked about during the interviews we did for the story in Coral Magazine. But no, you don't have to take it out after a few days. Leave that in there. Let it work. It's magic. Uh, Kemi Pure is actually really interesting. I'm, I'm kind of like, huh, now I think I want some of that. And it's something I've not ever used in the past. Uh, Winter Water said it's not solid. It's very thin and flexible, like a texture to a sponge. And you said it was coming out of the plumbing. It could actually be a type of sponge. It kind of is kind of thready. If we're talking about that, what you said looked like white paper. Uh, EIY says, can you ship Coral Magazine outside the United States? It does get shipped internationally. Yes, it costs more but because of shipping. And it takes longer to arrive. I did not know that a magazine that we print here and then send out to everyone that it takes something like a month extra to show up in a place like Australia or um, uh, what was another country? My brain is saying Brazil, but that feels wrong. But it was just like, really? It takes a whole extra month to arrive? That's so long. And Matt's like, oh yeah, that's normal. <laughs> I was like, ah, I can't believe it because, you know. But then again, I mailed something to somebody in Australia and it took, and it was just a little card with a stamp, and it took a month to show up. Just regular mail. I did not know that. <laughs> nice. I got it right. That was a good guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Um, <clears throat> my mom was married to a man for a duration. He was my stepdad, and he was big on acronyms. Man, everything was an acronym because he was a military guy. And I was always trying to figure out what the initials stand for. So when I saw yours, I was like, that actually looks like Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> Thank you, Fish Freak Phil. He says, I just subscribed to Coral Magazine. I've been saying that I would, and I finally did it. Thank you so much. I'm going to tell Matt that I did my job today. <laughs> Triggerfish says, I'll stop and subscribe to Coral right now. Yay! I'm so glad you guys are doing this. I would love to see every single person that has a saltwater tank in the United States have a copy. And I know that's unrealistic, but I, I feel like you can only benefit from it. It's uh, it's There's a lot of effort that goes into making each magazine. And the stories are great. And, uh, and we work really hard to make sure that the stories are great because 
uh, we put ourselves at such a high bar. Our standards are so crazy high. It's, it's so much work to get it right. And man, every word has to be correct. <laughs> it is, it's a little bit of a beating for me, but at the same time, it, it fits my personality a lot too, because I am a self-proclaimed perfectionist. I'm not perfect, but I sure try to be one all the time. Um, Ruben, I'm not sure what you're referencing, but I'll bring it up on the screen. I think you said, I have tried everything for Aptasia, even nudibranchs, but they died, unfortunately, 300 bucks down the drain or the overflow. But I'm going to try a new batch because, oh, caulk paste is the only thing that works. Caulk paste is one method. Um, you could use a putty like, you know, mix two-part putty and, and cover an area of Aptasia, like if you had a whole bunch of them. That's something uh, Richard Rosser recommends, and he says three weeks later you peel it off and they're gone. Uh, but F Aptasia works really well. The only thing that you have to be... Okay, so there's a couple things. Let's just talk about F Aptasia. So this is a product that Frank invented with um, a, a partner, and it is a paste, or it's a, you know, well, yeah, it looks like a paste. It looks like a slurry. Uh, you have to mix it super well. I mean, there's a little bottle and in the box, and there's a, a popsicle stick, and then there's a syringe with the needles. And the popsicle stick, and I think they also put beads inside there. Like when you shake a can of spray paint, you hear the clickety-clackety-clickety-clackety, and you're shaking the paint because the beads are beating up the paint and really chopping it up. I think there are some beads in the bottom of Epiptasia as well. But it's so thick when you receive it, you have to use the popsicle stick and stir, stir. It's super, super hard to stir. And you do it and do it and do it. I mean, it's like two minutes of really, really stabbing and twisting and, and turning and trying to stir and stir and stir until it's literally all liquid. You want complete liquid. So you have turned this pink, and they sell it in pink. So there was white. Now there's a pink version, so that's the one I sell. It's coralline color. And you stir it super, super well till it's completely mixed. That is so important. Then, now that you've got it completely stirred, <clears throat> you can fill up one, or in my case, multiple syringes. And I like to like fill up, I grab five. <laughs> and I got five of them sitting on, next to my tank. I turn up all the flow in the tank, all flow, nothing's running. And then I will completely cover the thing I want gone. So in the case uh, that I mentioned earlier was Aptasia, but like in my 400 gallon, I'm gonna have to start doing it with Mahanos. And I will completely cover it. And I will make sure that even if the animal retracts and puffs out some water and tries to blow away the Epiptasia to keep breathing, I will then cover it more. Like I'm putting so much frosting on this cupcake that I'm getting a toothache just watching it, right? I mean, seriously, you coat it completely. The only thing you have to be aware of is that where you're putting it, it could be drizzling down and it could be stinging something beneath it. So you have to be cognizant of where you're working. If you're able to like tilt the rock to make sure that it's facing up so where when you put it, the frosting stays in that spot, that would be ideal. But if you're dealing with something that's sticking out the side that's more tricky, you're going to have to maybe move what's underneath away from that spot so as it drizzles, it just falls on the sand. The stuff that you're putting in the tank <clears throat> is partially some kind of, um, let's call it a cement that becomes hardened over time. <clears throat> and it has acid inside it as well to burn and destroy the thing that you're trying to kill. So you are putting in <clears throat> this product that is going to slowly acid acidify the item beneath. Maybe it's crazy high pH. I don't know what it is, but it's that's what it's doing. And then the stuff that is becoming hard, it can take a long time to become hard. It can take 45 minutes. It can take an hour. So when you turn on flow, if you plug in the first power head, and the powerhead's water moves across and you see white dust happening, stop the pump immediately and wait another 15 minutes. And then plug the powerhead in again and look. And if nothing's coming off of it, it has now become hard, perfect. Now you start all the flow in the tank and let it just do its thing. And you have no snowflakes going through the tank. Snowflakes are bad because that means acid's going everywhere. We want to make sure it stays on the critter. And then after three days, you can go in <clears throat> And you can chip off the hardened white stuff or the pink stuff because of the different color and it'll be gone. And the thing that was there is gone too. It totally works. 
If you want to ignore it, you can wait and you can just ignore it. If you uh, want to try and pry it off as a piece, you could try, uh, but usually it breaks up pretty, it's very brittle. And so you're just siphoning out the little bits of stuff and the, the Aptasia, the Mahano, whatever, it's gone. That's how it works. But you have to stir it very, 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 very well. I can't emphasize the word very more than that. It has to be completely, completely dissolved. And so once you've stirred it super well, you apply it, make sure it doesn't land on anything you care about, and keep the flow off until it becomes solid. Once it's solid, and I don't mean touch it to see if it's solid, turn on the flow. If it starts moving, stop the flow. And then once it's uh, solid again, and you know you turn on the flow and it stays, you're good to go. And that's it, you're done. It works really, really well. Now, uh, something else I want to mention, don't do it nonstop. Don't uh, do all the tank at one time. Uh, that's the same with anything. Like we don't put frag, we don't plant frags in abundance at one time in a tank because the chemicals from the glue or the putty can become toxic because there's too much at one time. So if we had to plant, let's say we had a 40 gallon tank and we had to plant 40 frags, I would plant eight and then wait a few days and then plant eight and wait a few days or a week and then plant eight. That way we're only using a little bit of putty at a time. We're not creating this weird chemical reaction where the protein skimmer no longer wants to skim. Uh, we don't want to have something where the fish start swimming funny because they are being affected by some kind of toxicity because there's too much putty at one time. Once the putty has become hardened, it becomes inert, it's safe. But uh, if you were just going crazy and hog and try to plant all 40 frags at once, you could actually lose something or you could have protein skimmer problems or something else, you know? So we want to be same thing with FFTASIA. I would not just go through my reef and try to find every Mahano. I would work on this section and hit some here. Then I would deal with this section over here and hit some here. And then I'll go to the final section or whatever over a period of weeks. That's how I would handle it. Andrea says, I lost my store a year ago to fire. He's about to reopen next month and I can't hardly wait. That is awesome. I'm glad to hear the reopening. There was a store that was lost in um, Houston to a fire and it took forever for the rebuild and he's finally open. And it's a really nice store. Uh, EIY says, what camera are you using? The Sony ZV-E1? How is your camera following you? Any app? It is, um, I don't see the box. So this camera here is the OBS Tiny 4K camera. And it's a little tiny camera. Here, I'll, I'll do this. Let me switch here for a second. This one here, that looks right. And so this is my little tiny camera. And uh, I can't turn around because it's looking at me. <laughs> but uh, this is the camera here and it's keeping track of me right now. But that's the lens right there. And yeah, as I put it down, the camera will look up at me. And as I lift it up, it will look down at me. And as I go to my side, it will find me. It's really neat. So I, I got a couple of them and I have one here and I have one out in the studio. And it allows me to uh, conduct conversations and stuff. It works out really well. All right, back to this one here. And then, yeah, there's there's options in here, like I can click that and then it creates a little bit of space over the top of my head. I can do this, but I never do it. And then it zooms in. <laughs> I think maybe it'll go back. Let's see if it does it. Nice. So, and then for it to find you, you just do this and then it locks in on you and then it's with you. Here, it looks a little crooked. But uh, yeah, I like this. It's nice. It's not huge. Um, and if it's sitting on top of my monitor and I'm looking down here, I'm not looking at the camera. So instead what I've done is I've put it here <laughs> on top of a stack of cups. <laughs> if I put it on the desk, it's gonna be like this. So let's see if it can find me. It can't find me, I'm way down here. Let's do this. Can you find me? Can you find me? Yeah, too low. Um, but then I've got, it does come with some software to where you can control it from the screen, but that angle's terrible. I mean, so we can't do that. So instead I stick it on the cups and then I tell it to find me. And yeah, it can track me around the room, which is really nice. So it can be really useful for like shooting a video possibly. Carl Beals said, subscribe to Coral Magazine. Thanks for the reminder and the link. Yay. And you save 5%. Brian says, the algae scrubber takes out a lot of good elements out of the water, so you have to dose trace elements. But the benefit is that you can turn it on and off as needed and dial down the correct amount of time to keep. Um, that's true. Um, 
it the plants are going to consume what they need and if they're really growing robustly they will take all the iron out of the water which is why you're needing to dose more of it and there are some other trace elements too that are uh, ideal for algae turf scrubbers but the the overall goal of course is for it to capture the nitrate and the phosphate that that would be our, our priority Uh, Rather Be Traveling says, speaking of sponges, should you remove sponges that form in your tank? I leave the ones that form in the sump until I clean it. I actually love them. I um, I have no problem with sponges in the tank. I, I The more they grow, the better. And I very, very rarely will remove any, period. If there's some in the sump during a cleanup, you know, yeah, they, they go out the window. <laughs> they do. They, I do toss them because I'm cleaning the sump. I want to get the sump back to, I cannot wait to get this anemone cube up and running so I can really go into the fish room and clean out the sump, clean the area where the, where the heaters are, be able to have full access to the algae turf scrubber because I did it last night. Again, I had to move the tank out of the way, get the scrubber out, clean it out, which I neglected way too long and it's just foul, and uh, put it back together. I cleaned the protein skimmer and got that clean. Then I put the tank back into place. Oh, I need that thing gone. Thank God Coral is about to go to print. That means I have some time and I'm going to use some of that time to get the cube up. I'm not going to stop talking about it. I'm just going to get it done. I'm going to uh, get that off my list of things to do. I told you I was going to do it in 2024 and here we are. Cannot believe how long it's been waited. Rogue Gaming says the magazines are gorgeous. I'm going to mount on a bookshelf next to my tank for them. That's a great idea. All mine are right there. You can see them. there's a whole bunch there. And then the next shelf down below it is also Coral Magazine. So I've been a subscriber for a very long time. Briefer <laughs> says, Hey, Mark, I don't always catch your lives, but I have been watching your videos since the beginning. Thank you for all you do for the hobby, and please keep up the great work. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. Um, it does feel nice to be appreciated. And um, yeah, I, my goal always is education. Matter of fact, my uh, best friend asked me the other day, she said, what is your purpose in life? And I just said educator. It's literally what I've been doing forever. I've always taught people how to do things. I've always blogged how to do things. I've always explained how to do things. I wrote an article for the newspaper showing how to make a linzer torta. 20 something years ago or 30 years ago. I don't even know. Um, I'd just been doing it forever. When I, whenever I figured out anything in life, I always explained to anyone that was willing to listen how I did it because I thought it would help them. <laughs> I remember when I had emergency surgery um, to save my life. I didn't even know I was dying. And uh, I went in and they had no idea what was wrong. And they finally cut me open like, oh my God, he's, he's got peritonitis. Peritonitis kills you. Not even, I'm just walking in off the street saying something's wrong. And uh, they took out all my organs, they washed them off, they shoved them back in, and they stapled me together, and they kept me in a hospital bed for almost a week, and they wouldn't let me eat or drink anything. I only had ice chips for days because they said, if we have to go back in and fix whatever we broke, you can't have any food in your stomach. And the guy in the next bed over was having like five course meals, and I could smell them, and yet I wasn't allowed anything, nothing but ice chips. And I was just like... Ugh. So anyway, I survived it. They didn't have to go back in. Eventually, I got a, a released from the hospital. Is that the right word? And then they said, but you have to pick up this prescription. I was like, okay, that's fine. And uh, my mother flew in to take care of me. It was that bad. And she took me to the hospital. I walk in with my piece of paper. I have to wait in this. Uh, it was a hospital pharmacy. So the pharmacy's in the hospital. And I went in there to that one. And I'm waiting in a room with like 50 people. And finally, they say Levinson, and I go up, and I hand them the piece of paper, and they give me a bottle with, like, three pills in it. And I'm like, okay, and I leave. And then, like, I mean, maybe it was a little bit more. Maybe it was nine. I don't know. It was some tiny amount. And I had to keep coming back, like, every three days to get nine more pills or three more pills. And I was like, I'm back. I need to get this again. And the pharmacist just looks at me, and he says, you know you can get this anywhere, right? I'm like, no, I don't know that. I'm getting it here because that's what the doctor told me to do. And he said, you should look up a leave. I said, what's that? He goes, it's naproxen. I said, what's that? He goes, it's a leave. I'm like, what are you saying? How do you even spell that? And <laughs> he's, he wrote it down. He says, go to any store. Go to a pharmacy, go to a Kmart, go to a Walmart, go to the supermarket, look for a leave. I'm like, all right. And he... 
And so I did what he told me to do. You know, I went off and I went probably to Walmart and I found a bottle of Aleve with 200 tablets. And it was like $5. And yet these prescriptions for like these three pills at a time were costing me like five or 10 bucks a piece. And he was just like, you don't have to come here anymore. You don't have to wait in that lobby anymore. Because I was coming every few days to get a few more of this crazy pill. And, uh, and so I remember I wrote this huge rant on Facebook because it was like 2003. And I was like, if you don't know what naproxen is, let me tell you. And I wrote this missive about <laughs> how you can get it anywhere and how it helps with pain. And I've been on that stuff forever. But um, it, it, it <laughs> I don't have to go to the farm. Anyway. Always educated people on anything. I can't help it. It's just how I'm wired. Uh, Burke says, I keep them, meaning the magazines, on my coffee table for people to see. So do I. Except when it's right here for the live stream. <laughs> I really should put one in each room. Carl Beal says... For what it's worth, with carbon dosing versus a scrubber, I use Nopox, a scrubber, a reef mat, a skimmer, lanthanum chloride, and automatic water change. Okay, you've got it covered. You're using it all. Um, Rather Be Traveling says, I have a flame angel that is a bully of my tank. It causes the other fish to hurt themselves. It caused Popeye. How do I stop it? Do I need to remove it from the tank? You might need to. You might need to take the fish out of the tank. Uh, you know how some people use the word sump it, like put it in the sump? You could take the fish out of the tank and put it in the sump or put it in a small 10 or 20 gallon for a week or two and then reintroduce it and maybe it won't be as territorial. Another thing that sometimes works, but it's even more effort, you remove the fish from the water and you rearrange the rock work in the tank to get yourself a new aquascape. And then like after the week or two, you put the fish back in and it's like a completely new reef that fish has never been on before. And again, you might have taken the aggression out of it. But if the aggression continues after you've tried those type of draconian measures, you may have to just return it and get another flame angel or or just say, I'm not going to keep one at this time. I don't know what size your tank is, um, but sometimes a fish can be more aggressive if the tank's not big enough. That is a thing. So that might be another consideration. But if it's being super aggressive, I mean, I had a six line wrasse named Spike and he uh, was super angry all the time. And I finally just removed them. And then I had a long nose hawkfish that would chase. And that's a crazy fish. I mean, it has no swim bladder. It perches all the time. And it was literally chasing my copper band all the time. The long nose hawkfish never stopped moving. It was swim, chase, swim, chase, swim, chase. I was like, how are you even doing that without a swim bladder? And the copper band was running for its life. And I knew the next stage it was going to do. It was going to burst out, you know, covered in ick because of stress. And I was just like, nope. And I took the hawkfish to Frank's and said, I need to give you this fish. Can you put it in one of your maintenance aquariums where they're huge or sell it to a customer that has a big tank? He's like, yeah, absolutely. I was like, okay, great. And I'll take that one right there. And he had a little tiny cute one. I put it in my tank and I could not believe the difference in size between what I'd given him versus what I put in my tank because I was so used to seeing this fish this big. I mean, I know that's an exaggeration. But it felt like it was this big in my reef. And now I had something that was like this big in my reef. <laughs> it was like, it's so tiny. And it wasn't. It was a normal sized fish. But mine had grown pretty big and for some reason hated the copper band and wouldn't let up on the chasing. And so sometimes I just trade in, get an, a younger model. <laughs> that sounds terrible. But that's what I did. And uh, the problem was resolved. <laughs> I cannot wait for the comments in this video. <laughs> Aiden says, I, in Australia, I get my coral magazine issue just as the new one comes out in the United States. Yeah, you're really like a month, six weeks behind. That is crazy. Briefer says, I subscribed in Christmas. When do you think I'll get my first issue? You would get this one for sure. Um, because Christmas was past December 12th. I think December 12th was the cutoff date, probably the December 11th. We... Tell everyone, subscribe now, right before we go to press, so we can get your name into the list. And when people buy it, like, one or two days after we go to press, I'm like, ah, oh, you just added two extra months of waiting. It's just, it's such a long wait, and I hate that for you. So we really, really press hard, telling everyone, subscribe right now, do it now. The deadline is here. It's sort of like filing your taxes for the IRS. You have to do it by the 15th, you know? So we're always telling people right before the, I mean, we do this push every two months. 
And we tell everyone, do it now, do it now, do it now. So yeah, that's why I brought it up. Katie May just says, I just subscribed to the magazine. Yay, I'm so glad to hear that. Jacob says, thanks for everything you do for the hobby. I just subscribed. Yes, I love this. So many new subscribers. It's so great. I am so happy you're doing this. Uh, Scott says, sorry I'm late. Scottish Scott in the house. Hope you're well. I am. Thank you very much. Where I will be traveling just said, just subscribe too. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Michael says, I would subscribe right now, but I have three heartaches and I'm trying to get disability, so I'm not working. I don't have the money right now. All right. Fair enough. But as soon as you're back on your feet, I'm going to be looking for your name. Uh, Rogue Gaming says, Ulanzi makes a nice, uh, not expensive tripod with quick release plates. I'm kind of thinking I might make an acrylic bracket I can hang on the monitor instead of using these cups. And because it's acrylic, it'll be see-through, which would make it really nice to see all these little windows because you guys can't see my desktop. And I know that these guys do it all the time. They do something where they show their entire screen, but um, I don't do it on my stream. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a lot going on here on this. And right now I've got it. It's actually pretty simple because this was a conversation today and was not a presentation where I've got an iPad here as well and I'm going through the slides or um, trying to play extra videos or have my cheat sheet of notes of things I want to discuss. None of that's on the screen today. It's really your chat. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven additional windows, all for the live stream. Triggerfish says, bring back the Reef Diaries. I am so busy with Coral Magazine and Mila's Reef. I just don't see that happening, but I'm not going to say never. And there are some really cool builds coming up this year. Um, you guys know the Anemone Cube is happening. I've got something else that I've mentioned a couple of times. It's going to be redone after all these years. That's being torn out, changed, and that's going to be a series. And then I've got a new tank build that's coming up this year as well. And that you guys will definitely be on board for. And that could be Reef Diary stuff. It really could. It could be great. Let's see. Um... Ah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the correction there. I was like, what, Phil? He says, any thoughts on keeping clams in the sump to assist with filtration? Some people have tried clams like in the refugium or, you know, like you said, somewhere in the sump. There are some filter feeder clams, but I kind of feel like you need a lot of them. I think most hobbyists prefer to buy a really pretty clam to put in the display tank. And I've had a few people on this, you know, live stream in the chat say, Mark, we got to get a clam in your tank, but I keep thinking I've got a coral beauty... I've got a copper band. I kind of have a feeling the clam won't survive. But the anemone cube might be a great place for two or three pretty clams to be down on the sand bed because it's clownfish and bengais. And those fish don't care about clams. So that's a possibility that could happen. And then I talked about this other tank build. So there's a possibility that that could happen in that tank as well. Something to be excited. Yes, Andrea, I'm wearing a Benepets shirt. You just now notice. Have you just been listening to the show and not watching? Look, I'm right here, right here, right here. Look at that, benefits, benefits, benefits. It's me. <laughs> yeah, I wore it today. All right. <laughs> Yoda says, super late I am. <laughs> uh, Scott Morrison says, I just noticed there's no tank in the background. Granted, it's been a while since I've watched, but why? The reason why is because I created the studio here. And it allows me to do all my work and do my live streams. And my camera's permanently mounted. My lighting's permanently mounted on the walls. Uh, setting everything up like you see in the intro of the video where I did in front of the tank, I found that the tank never looked good. I did what I could, but it never looked great because I'm standing in front of the tank and I'm in focus, which means the depth of field put the tank in a softer look. Now, what I can do is I can put this on the screen. I can put this on the screen and then I could put myself over that, which I have done in the past with the use of a green screen. And that would allow me to show the reef and you guys could see it. And it was kind of nice. But um, instead, what I've done is I've just kind of focused on the education part. And uh, I have included the tank in the streams as allowed. And I'm trying to I want to get to the point here in 2024 where we have a weekly live stream and then we have a video of something pertaining to the reef tank every week. I'd love to do that. I'd like to do a, a edited video and a live stream weekly. That's my goal. But Coral Magazine, this has been something new for me. I've been a subscriber forever. 
Um, of course, read it, but just read it, you know, like you do. You read. <laughs> you don't really think about all the effort behind it. And this issue of Core Magazine that's coming out now is my third issue. I've done two so far. This is my third one. With each issue, I it becomes a little bit easier. I'm st <laughs> still making mistakes. I mean, it's just it's just the reality. But uh, I am trying my best to get these issues out in a timely fashion. I'm working with a team now, which is harder for me because I'm used to being an only child and I just kind of do my thing when I do it. And instead, I have to do things early enough that the team can then pick up and continue from that part. And then it comes back to me and I have to review it and then make adjustments or corrections or complete changes or modifications. I mean, I know it sounds like the same thing, but it's not. And then it goes back to them again to make those corrections. And then I have to verify they were made correctly. And then the editors have to look at it and make sure there's no mistakes. And then finally, someone else that literally looks for the tiniest minutia will find like a double space. We'll find um, uh, an inch mark that should be an apostrophe. <laughs> They go through every single page, 116 pages, looking for any kind of mistakes. And it's a whole process. And then it finally goes to press, and then I get a break. And that right there is so time-consuming that it makes it really hard for me to uh, do lots of ex extra things right now. But like I said, the more educated I get on this, the, the more it becomes second nature, the more I can balance my life out a little bit better. And uh, I feel like I can produce the things I liked doing in the past. Be more of it. So it's something to look forward to. <laughs> you got that Star Wars reference. Nice. <laughs> okay, so that's the answer to your question about the tanks. Let me switch this back to here. I like the Q&A frame. Um, Ravelby Traveling says... My tank is a 225 gallon tank where I live. We don't have a local fish store and I need to get you to make me a peacemaker. What information do you need for the Eurobrace tank? I need to know what the top piece needs to be, the total length to sit on the Eurobrace and just the Eurobrace. I don't want it to sit on the plastic trim. I want it to be on the Eurobrace so it fits inside. I actually have a picture I can show you guys to give you a visual. Where did my little finder go? It's hiding another window. Let me put this here. I will show you what I'm talking about because mine sits within my Euro bracing. Peacemaker. So we'll put this right here. And you can see the Peacemaker is sitting on the inner lip of my Euro brace. So my Euro brace is two layers of glass. Um, I could have made it wide enough to go glass to glass, if that makes sense, to sit on top of the thicker one. But since I had that little inner rim that's like an inch wide, I chose to make it that, and that way the Peacemaker wasn't quite so long. So in your situation, you may find that um, your tank, which is, uh, well, I'm going to assume your tank is maybe 24 inches wide. Your Euro bracing might be three inches on the front and the back. You probably need a Peacemaker that might be 22 inches long, so a couple inches sit on each piece of Euro brace so it won't fall in the tank. That's the idea. So that's the information I need to know. All right. Wow, Triggerfish says I got my, I, when I first got my long nose hawkfish, it was small enough that it jumped through quarter inch netting when I dropped it in the tank. That's crazy. That was a tiny fish. Aw, Will says, and he gave me a super chat, and he said, I subscribe because of you. I love them all. I love hearing that. Coral Magazine is really that good. So thank you so much for the super chat. Um, Rogue Gaming says I just plumbed a 50 gallon to my sump just for clams make sure you post pictures I want to see it uh, Willem says I've been feeding Benepets for the last year it's been good for growth without phosphate increase exactly uh, Andrea says it's the only food I use aside from frozen mysis And then EIY says, a few months ago, I bought a rock of Rasta Zoas. There were 30 to 40 Rastas and four or five of another orange one that are not so good looking. Um, as time went on, the orange Zoas multiplied and killed the Rastas. Should I cut out the orange ones with scissors or a blade? Is it safe? Can I get poly polytoxin poisoning? Uh, I would say that you can trim them out carefully. Uh, if you want, throw on a face mask, wear some rubber gloves, wear eye protection so you don't get squirted. 
and then you can remove the one that is being too aggressive so you can enjoy the Rastas, because I understand, you know, it's the better looking Zoa. It makes sense. Uh, the Rastas actually are the Pallies. The orange ones, are they Pallies? Because they might be Zoanthids, and they have a lesser amount of Palytoxin. Um, I, I know it, we use the word Pally, 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 but there's a thing out there called Palythoa. It's a very specific creature. I have it in my 400 gallon. It's on the right side of my tank. Right here, this one here. It's on the right side of my tank. You can see it there right under the Coral Beauty. And that one there has like these brown and green oral discs. It's under the green hammer if you haven't seen it yet. And they are super toxic and they grow into a reef mat. They literally make a mat that spreads over the rock and then the polyps emerge from this rubbery mat. And that is the palytoxin maker of the ocean. <laughs> it is the super toxic one. And I got mine in 2002, 2003, and I've always had some in my tank. And I just don't lick them. It's the rule. Don't lick your pallies. But there are zoanthids that are called pally, and then there are zoanthids called zoanthids because of the size of the head. And um, the orange ones, whether I, I just don't think you have big pally orange ones. I think you have little zoanthids. They are less toxic, but you still want to be careful. And to be honest, I mean, maybe you could split the rock or transplant the rastas to a different rock and let them grow there and have this really pretty orange rock and a, a nice section of rastas. That might be the way to go. Mackenzie says, any tips to lower nitrate? Best tip I can give you, fastest solution is a 50% water change will change, will cut your number in half immediately and then uh, do another 50 percent and another 50 percent and if you can do those like every two days every three days you will literally cut down your nitrate from a high number to a low number in a week i mean it's that fast uh, other products that work on the market would be nitrate r which is a, a type of super buoyant resin that you could put in a reactor it's made by brightwell i sell it in my shop it totally works and the small jar i think is for 100 gallons the large jar, I think, is for 200 and uh, totally works, and it works well, and it does not take long, and it's rechargeable, which means you can use it over and over and over, so it's a really nice investment if you want to go that route. Um, and then, you know, we talked about earlier about vodka dosing, which is carbon dosing. Um, there's the uh, product from uh, Red Sea, Nopox. That is another one that I have tried, didn't have much success with, but that's another one that's known to lower nitrate. So there's a few answers right there. Let's see. And then Michael says, as soon as I can, I'm going to subscribe to Coral Magazine. Michael, where's your credit card? Just bust it out. <laughs> that's it. I'm not going to push anymore. Let's see. All right, guys, it is the end of the live stream. How are we doing on time? We are, whoa, how did this stream go this long? Whew. I was supposed to be done at four o'clock. I messed up. I'm sure people are freaking out at Coral Magazine. Uh, it is time to test your water. It is the weekend. We al I always recommend water test Saturday is the day to do it, just to get you guys in the habit so when Saturday happens, you're like, I gotta test my water today. It's just supposed to be ingrained in you, just like it is in me. And if you can test your water, you're going to make sure that your livestock lives a healthy life. Now, water testing is not the only solution to keeping a tank healthy, but it is an important way to know the parameters so that everything can be adjusted as needed. If alkalinity is getting a little too high, you can lower the dose this week to bring it down and test again. And you're like, aha, I got it. Or you could say, oh my God, I'm out of magnesium. My number's really low. What's going on? Like, I didn't mix up a batch. Let me make another batch today. And you hook it up to a dosing pump and let it start resuming its dose. Uh, checking salinity is so important for tanks that are on automatic water changes because that that number can drift. It can actually, you can get very diluted water and your salt level can drop because of water changes coupled with protein skimmers overflowing, coupled with top off adding water nonstop automatically where you're not observing it. And if you ignore this and don't check your salinity once a week, you could, you know, and some months go by and you finally check and like, wow, my tank's at 1.019. No wonder I'm losing corals. Like, yep, you hit that tipping point. They finally gave up. So that if you're checking weekly, salinity cannot possibly swing from 1.026 to 1.019 without some really wet carpet. <laughs> it's just not possible. So if you are checking weekly, you will not let these things get away from you and you will have a nice healthy tank. And if you're not going to do it, you can always hire a service and keep them in business and let them come do the water testing and the water changes and do all this stuff. So you can just enjoy the tank. That's another choice. You can pay someone else to do the water testing. 
but you should do it every single week. Thank you so much for tuning in this time this week. I really appreciate it. Look forward to next week. I'll give you a hint. The person we're going to have on is Richard Ross, and we haven't had him on in a while, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. I think that it'll be a really dynamic one because he's hilarious. Guys, enjoy your weekend. Got to go. Bye.